Hi, welcome back guys. This is your sensei, back with another fanfiction. This is the first part of, What if Naruto got harem with Willow? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. There is a saying in Atlas, Don't. Mess. With. A Schnee. Crash. Willow Schnee was looking at a dead man. At least, she was fairly certain he must be dead because the blonde before her looked as though he'd fallen through a blender and lost an arm somewhere in the midst of it. There was no use in asking where he'd come from. She'd seen it herself. He'd fallen from the night sky and crashed headlong into her garden without warning. While she was standing in it, a twist of fate that did not go unnoticed by the Schneeris. She hadn't been able to sleep, so she'd thought to take a walk here, hoping a glass of wine would settle her nerves and lull her to a sleep. To be fair, it had settled her nerves, until this screaming buffoon nearly landed atop her. The impact might have killed him, she theorized, feeling slightly guilty. Even as the stranger slumbered, the stump of his left arm continued to bleed, staining said garden right alongside the wine she had spilled. Still, she couldn't avert her eyes from the sight any more than she could will the moon to fall from the sky. She could only stare. On a certain level, she knew what was to be expected of her, just as she chafed at their implications of what she was about to do. She should have screamed for father, called the police, at the very least. She was a schnee, after all. She shouldn't hesitate. Certain things were expected of her. She was a young woman with an appearance to maintain an appearance that did not involve hoodlums dying on her property, which was precisely what this one would do if she left him alone. The longer she looked, the more certain she became. By the gods, he didn't even look to be breathing. That couldn't be good. She couldn't just gape at him like a gaudy socialite. Action was required. Didn't mean she had to like it, though. Oh, for the love of. With a put-upon sigh, Willow knelt and, gripping his uninjured shoulder, turned him over. There. And more than this and she'd get yet more blood on her nightgown. Now he wouldn't suffocate in the roses, at least. With his body sprawled out before her, Willow found she could get a better look at this sleeping stranger. Whiskered cheeks lay pinched in a slumbering scowl, framed by a matted mess of blonde hair. His body looked to be in a bad way as well as battered orange jacket flung open over a mesh shirt to expose a tapestry of countless cuts interposed over faded scars that ran the length of his chest. Then there was the matter of his arm, that looked messy, as though it had been blow clean off just below the elbow. Still, he wasn't quite as young as she'd initially expected. They seemed nearly of an age with one another. That knowledge did nothing to ease her conscience. If you're sleeping, I'm going to be very cross with you. She scowled. The young man still didn't move. Willow gulped softly. This was pointless. A small voice hissed at her as she bent to expect him. Father expected her to meet and likely marry a man named Jack on the morrow. Whatever would he think if he saw her like this with some hooligan more than anything she wanted to run away and become a huntress. She had her weapon, she had her semblance, and she had her glyphs. She was certain she could make a good show of it but it would never happen. No matter how much she might yearn for it. She was father's only heir he'd hound her to the ends of remnant if she fled. Not out of any spite of course, but because he wanted the best for her. That was the problem. But father didn't know about this boy. Not yet. So she nudged him with her heel. Excuse me are you alive? No response. A muscle jumped in Willow's jaw. Was he mocking her she felt like he was mocking her. Tentatively she reached out and laid a pair of pale fingers against the nape of his neck, seeking a vein. When they didn't produce a pulse, she dared display her palms across his shirt and lay her head on the cleaner part of his chest. His body was warm, even in the brisk night air and she struggled to ignore it. She'd never been this close to anyone before. This might be a corpse for all she knew. But no, as she laid her head down on his chest, a thin reedy pulse greeted her ear. Well he was alive. Surely that was a good thing. Wasn't it she would have felt horrid if someone died in front of her. Unfortunately, it also left Willow at something of an impasse. She lacked the raw physical strength to move him further and while she could use one of her glyphs to wake him, she doubted the stranger would take too kindly to a fireball in the face. Or an electric shock. Perhaps a bit of ice or even. In the end, the choice was taken from her. Dirg. This time Willow did yelp, but only for a moment. Blue eyes burst open with a gasp and the stranger's chest lurched violently beneath her ear, causing the pale-haired lass to jump. Unfortunately, with her legs tucked beneath her, she only succeeded in tumbling backward instead. She didn't get very far before his remaining hand shot out like a snake and coiled around hers. His grip was terrifying she felt her wrist fracture almost immediately under the pressure. Willow tensed, expecting an attack as he pulled her closer. Any moment now and she'd find a dagger in her ribs. Please. The word was a croak, little more than a groan. Help me. A beat of silence passed between man and women alike. Well, shit. Willow managed eloquently. It was such a heartfelt play on words, such an earnest plea, that she found herself unable to refuse it. Frightened azure orbs gleamed back at her in the moonlight, baffled by everything, and she could no sooner refuse his request than she could cease breathing. He looked so lost and afraid alone in the world that something in her heart lurched. Was she really going to refuse his request out of fear she was a schnee? They did not balk in the face of duty, even when held captive by someone going into shock. Willow made a snap decision. Rather than pull away, as any sane individual would, she reached out with her free hand and wrapped her fingers his. His grip on her wrist slackened that bone-cracking force abating enough for her to pull her other hand free and place it over his own. 
For a moment, his body almost seemed to pulse gold, a gold that guttered out soon thereafter when she made no move of aggression towards him. What is your name? she asked of him. Hazy blue orbs fluttered rapidly. I Naruto, he muttered. My name is Naruto. Willow considered the stranger's name for a moment, memorized it, then nodded her head. Naruto. She repeated it, watching the tension drain from his body as he sat up. That's a unique name. I have not heard it before. You may call me Willow. A slow blink served as his sole response and the Shni heiress bowled on with singular determination. I'm here now, Naruto. She cooed softly, repeating his name for effect. Rest. I won't leave your side. Terror burned brighter in his eyes and she redoubled her efforts to calm him as best she could. You're going to be alright. I'll get you a medic. What happened to my arm? He blinked owlishly at his mangled limb, and this time, she didn't have answers for him. His eyes squinted, but it was clear that he was slowly losing the battle against his own battered body. Where am I? He croaked, shaking his head. I don't recognize this place. How did I get here? You're safe, Willow repeated, smooth fingers running over his gently. Sleep. I can't. His words, that little whisper, was a dagger in her heart. I might not wake up. A spark ignited deep within her bosom, fire and defiance. You will. She growled. I swear it. He surprised her with laughter. Have hey, you say so. Just like that. As Willow looked on in mild consternation, the young man who called himself Naruto relaxed against her, eyes finding hers for only a moment before he succumbed to sleep. When he pitched backward she flailed to catch him with one arm, still clinging to his hand with the other. He didn't fight, his body turning to dead weight against her arm. A breathing weight, thank the gods. She released a breath she hadn't realized she'd holding until this very moment, only to realize she still hadn't let go of his hand. She almost couldn't bear to, so she didn't. Fishing her scroll out from her scroll, Willow hastily dialed a number. Yes, hello, she began calmly. I'd like to report an accident. Once the call concluded, she made another decision. Screw daddy dearest, screw what he would think of this. For the first in her life, someone had asked her for help. Her, Willow Schnee. Not for wealth or power or even influence. Just one human being to another. She didn't know who Naruto was. Didn't know where he was from or even if he was a good person. But he'd asked her for help. And she'd be damned if she let him die on her watch. She had a reputation to uphold after all. It would reflect poorly upon herself if he perished her. Or so Willow told herself. She repeated the lie over and over until she almost believed it. Almost forgot the heat in her cheeks. Almost forgot that tiny, faint flutter of her heart. Almost but it was still there. Sighing softly, Willow tucked her patient's head into her lap and resolved wait for the paramedics. Such a simple choice the tiniest spark of defiance. And yet that spark would one day become a raging flame one fierce enough to discorch even the coldest hearts. Jack never stood a chance. Why, you ask because now, when she did meet him, her heart would be hardened against him. She wouldn't be deceived by a handsome face, wouldn't fall prey to his pretty, poisonous words, never tumble into the twisted web he wove, never fall under his twisted little thumb, never fell prey to his machinations. She had no way of knowing that she'd just changed her fate. By this single act of kindness, not just change her world, but the whole of Remnant. Because from this single, seemingly harmless encounter, everything would begin to change. Hey, and yup, just did that. Willow is not weak in this story. Not at all. Think of her as the best of Weiss and Winter combined and the result she's quite stubborn. I feel I should also mention that we'll get to see Summer and Raven in this, given the timeline. And of course, Drunkle Kiro. You know, I take personal pleasure in screwing over Jack by denying him his chance with Willow and essentially the Schnee name. Nasty little weasel married into the Schnee family for nothing but power he deserves all the misfortune he gets. Never mind Volume 4, Volume 7 made me see it after learning all of his nasty stunts. Naruto's fighting days aren't done either he's got a few more fights left in him. Even with one arm assuming he doesn't accept a replacement he can still beat the tar out of his enemies. He's like to get a mechanical arm, though with a vicious little twist that I'm sure you'll like. We haven't seen the last of Jack yet either. He's a vicious little you know. Before anyone asks, yes, Winter and Weiss will still be born. But not Whitley. Screw that little brat. He'll be replaced. So in the immortal words of Atlas, review, would you kindly, and enjoy the previews. You certainly recovered quickly. His smile was sunshine itself. Yeah, I always heal fast. Were you worried about me? Willow's pale face turned scarlet. And I know surely not it would just reflect poorly upon me if you died. Is that a yes? Leave this to your betters, boy. Why, I have half a mind to. Naruto's open palm cracked across Jack's face, sending him stumbling away. Oh, I'm sorry. My hand slipped. Why you impudent pup? Oops slipped again. Willow didn't smile. No, surely not. She did. So you can fight, right? Willow's rapier came up under his chin. Would you care to repeat that question, good sir? Naruto laughed, and her frigid smile melted. No question answered. Oh, who's he? Is he the reason we're here, but he doesn't look all that special? Raven exhaled in a pewed upon sigh. Summer, sit. She did. Your hair is going white. Willow hummed softly as she stroked his scalp. Naruto laughed as she continued to tend to him. I think it makes me look distinguished. The single quality that is common across every living creature on this planet is fear. It's funny then, that as common as fear is, we so easily underestimate its power. Fear of growing close to someone. The subsequent fear of loss. Fear of failure. And as more people depend on you, those fears can take on greater power. 
but the fear itself isn't worthy of concern. It is who we become while in its clutches. Will you be proud of that person? Will you forgive them? Will you understand why they felt the need to do the things they did? Will you recognize them? Or will the person staring back at you be the very thing you should have feared from the start? You're just one person. That much is true. But you are also an army. A symbol. A beacon, if you will. Will you take a stand for what you believe in for power or for those you love? Will you fight to the bitter end or will you give in to your darkest fears? Will you simply forsake it all and run away that lies with you? I suppose we will all find out sooner or later. Modified Osbin quote. Tha. So, missing an arm. This was his life now. Oddly enough, Naruto wasn't too terribly bothered by it. Instead, he stood strong in the sunlight, bleary blue eyes gazing at the bandaged stump of his left arm. He waved it to and fro, sighing when there wasn't any pain, only the faintest ache accompanied by a weightless sensation. Hirama had done his work well, maybe a little too well. He would have liked to reattach the limb if he could. It was a boy's wish, one he stubbornly quashed in the blink of an eye. He wouldn't get upset over this. He wouldn't let it break him. He refused to. Still, losing an arm had changed him. Hardened something in his heart. Maybe that was a good thing. Maybe it wasn't. Who could say? For anyone else, the wound would have been crippling. Downright debilitating, really. For him it was a mild inconvenience at best. Annoying to be sure, but he was certain he could overcome this handicap. After all he'd said and done, he wasn't about to let something like a lost limb weigh him down. He couldn't afford to. Who knew, he might be able to grow it back given time. Yeah, that's not happening. Hirama creaked on open in the back of his mind. I'm good, but I'm not that good. You'll have to adjust, says the guy who grew back my right lung. As Shinobi snarked, wearing the ghost of a smile. We'll deal with this somehow. I know it. Well, we can still use the cloak to compensate. His partner shot back. I dare say you'll be all right. Better than all right. Would he his body felt overcharged, as though he were soaking in a warm bath. Not all ironic, give that he'd just taken one. His rumor was that a cell was remarkably well furnished and that it had seemed to haul his needs thus far. A spacious cot and the remnants of a brisk breakfast of bacon and eggs with a glass of milk lay finished on a table beside his bed as fresh morning sunlight spilled through the window. Yup, bathing, breakfast, even a change of clothes. Not that he'd ever willingly forsake the colors of orange and black, but in this case, he hadn't much choice in the matter. Hirama actually snickered. I've never heard you scream that loudly. Naruto flailed an arm and attacked his breakfast again with renewed ferocity. Oh, shut up. What are you going to do? Then the fox surprised him with the abrupt question. This isn't our world. Not anymore. There was the proverbial elephant in the room. He hadn't wanted to believe it but one look out the window had told him all he needed to know. His keen eyesight saw the rest of city in the sky, the great flying machines looming out there in the clouds above, and the curious-looking folk in the streets below. He'd seen a perfectly ordinary woman with rabbit ears talking to a man with a tail. That that wasn't normal. Dense he may well be, but he knew when to face facts. Kurama was his ally now, he had nothing to gain from lying. I know. The words tasted bitter on his tongue, well figured out, I guess. Later, he smacked his lips, shuddering slightly. The air here feels weird. His eyes flickered gold the moment he thought to focus. Too charged with natural energy. Isn't that a good thing the old fox rumbled, flicking a tail dismissively. Sage mode will last longer. Not if I get drunk on chakra. He groused. That's not something I want to attempt anytime soon. Wait. Can you even get chakra drunk? Kuramsa sounded far too intrigued. Are you seriously proposing we do that a blonde growl arched back? Hey, better to pop that cherry sooner rather than later. Kurama. His partner retreated with a laugh, leaving him to reflect upon his actions. Of course there had been a bit of a panic on his part when he'd woke in a strange room to begin, clad in little more than bandages, but that was behind him. Now that the fear of his imminent demise was gone, he found he could almost think rationally. Mostly, already the bloodied rags of his orange jumpsuit were gone incinerated, as a man named Klein had briskly informed him upon waking forcing him to don this new outfit that had been left out for him. Now, clad in a faded navy blue button-down shirt and a pair of grey trousers, he stood ready ready to face the day with some semblance of his sanity relatively intact. Mostly, can't ignore it any longer, I suppose. Naruto blew out a breath, then pulled hard on his chakra for a fleeting instant his body burned black and gold before he tamped it back down. He wasn't weakened in any way. All his powers remained intact his reserves were even now brimming with life and vitality, his wounds all but healed by the time he had awoken. By rights, he had nothing to worry about. There was just own small concern. A tiny ripple in the still ocean that was his mind. It should have been nothing to worry about. Yet still, it lingered. In his hand. As ever, when he looked to his remaining arm and saw his palm, his stomach still roiled with confusion. A pale full moon gazed back at the last jinchuriki, overshadowed by a dark crescent looming above like some half-looted eye to protect it, safeguarding it from harm. These were the sage marks, the ones he'd given to him and Sasuke, now fused into some strange symbol. Naruto clenched his hand into a claw and pale blue sparks sprang into life around it, keening like a thousand birds before he made a fist. Just like that, it vanished in an instant, leaving his arm tingling, never to return. What did it mean why did he have this new mark a final gift of some sort it didn't make any sense. Sasuke was gone there could be no denying it anymore. He'd seen him die with his own eyes. They'd fought Kaguya viciously before sacrificing their arms to seal her away in a final desperate pact. 
They'd succeeded, too. It would have been all well and good but the vengeful goddess had proven herself something of a sore loser. Even as her body disintegrated she'd lashed out at him in a final, spiteful attack. He'd been too weakened to escape, certain he would die. Until his old friend was suddenly there shoving him aside denying the rabbit goddess her revenge. And so the attack found him instead. His last memory of Sasuk would forever be his crumbling corpse dot dot and wasn't that just going to haunt his nightmares for a while right up there with nearly falling to his death. But then, just when he'd thought he was going to Disomion had held his hand. She'd said she would stay with him. He recalled pale eyes and hair the color driven snow, a soft smile. Someone has a crush. Kirama jabbed him in his moment of weakness. Asshole, he grumbled, staggering to a nearby mirror. I just want to thank her. Yeah, that's it. Still, that's not a bad look you've got there. Seems the stress took more of you than we thought, though. Baruto fought down a twitch thankfully. His reflection remained very much his own if one were to ignore the streaks of white in his hair. Those hadn't been there before. It was another galling reminder of the hell he'd been through. The battle against Kaguya had taken a toll on his mind to be sure, but he'd bounced back from worse. It was his body that had taken a beating a body that at one point held the chakra of nearly every tailed beast. Even now he could feel their remnants burning through his veins. Although to his relief, it seemed only Kurama's consciousness had made the trip through the rift with him. Shukaku and the others were great by all means, but he wasn't sure he could handle that many voices in his head right now. Or much of anything, really. Right. He breathed, pinching the brow of his noise, we've got this. Nothing's wrong. We're all right. You're not, are you? Of course I'm not all right a small, hysteric laugh burst out of the blonde as he whipped back to the mirror, cracks etching in the facade he'd worked so hard to erect. How can you expect me to be fine I'm terrified this is our world his reflection glared back at him with red eyes. My best friend died for me to send me here. I don't even know why. I have to live with that live with the knowledge that our world might be on freaking fire for all we know did stopping Kaguya release her jetsu did we stop black setsu did we achieve anything more than a stalemate did we win did we lose I don't know the answers. I'm never going to know them. His reflection Kirama tilted its head and considered him for a long moment before speaking. It's not your fault, you know. You did your best. It is my fault. Naruto swept an arm across the banister with explosive force sending everything flying to the floor. Pain slashed across his palm. He didn't feel it. Didn't care. His fist shot out again, only narrowly missing the mirror at the last moment to barrel through the wall instead. Something popped in his hand and healed a heartbeat later. So he punched again. And again. 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 Until he was staring at a hole in the wall. A maid gaped at him from within the nest room, her face ashen. Guilt twisted in his gut, but she skittered away before he could apologize. Naruto's rage guttered out a heartbeat later as his knees buckled, leaving him powerless. I should have been smarter. He sighed, taking his head in his hand, staining one side of his face red. I should have fought harder. Aye, none of that Kirama's growl silenced him as he bodily took control before Naruto could find something else to punch. I one of you wallowing in guilt after everything you sacrificed. You're alive. You get to fight another day. Yes, you lost someone. I've lost more friends in my lifetime than you can possibly imagine. Leave getting home to me. I'll figure something out. Despite himself, Naruto almost dared to perk up. You have an idea. Never you mind that. You have company. I, I'm sorry. A familiar voice chimed from the doorway, bringing him up viciously short. Am I interrupting anything? Naruto didn't jump. Jumping implied he hadn't heard the newcomer because he hadn't. He'd been so wound up in his emotions his guilt that he hadn't even sensed her approach. Stubbornly he tamped down on this fuel and choked it out until only a cold core of smoldering rage began. Then he took that and crushed it in his fist, willing himself to smile when all he wanted to do was scowl. Good luck, love a boy Kirama caught at him. I swear, I'll find a way to strangle you. Thus, he turned his head, gulping. And saw. Oh, did he see. Unlike last night, Willow now wore her pale hair in a low ponytail over her left shoulder. In place of the sheer nightgown he'd seen before forget 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 her newfound attire consisted of a white cravat secured by a silver brooch set with a red stone as well as a light purple jacket with light sleeves, and a wide belt around her waist complete with a pale skirt that creased an inch above her knees. There was even a slit in the side to better allow for free movement. He soon saw why. Was that a rapier at her hip it was. Yikes. It was as if the vulnerable young woman he'd glimpsed last night had been swept aside, replaced by a queen of snow. No, an ice queen. And why the devil did she have a comb in her right hand? Oh, hey, I remember you, he said less than eloquently as his savior leaned against the doorframe. Her name came to him after a moment. Willa Wright, that is my name, yes. She crossed both arms beneath her bosom and he tried to ignore the things it did to her breasts. Are you well? This time he didn't have to feign it his smile was sunshine itself. Yeah, I always heal fast. Don't concern yourself. Her gaze strayed to his right hand, the hand that he even now realized was bleeding. You're hurt. I heal fast. He parroted, stubbornly tucking his arm behind his back. It's a deep wound. She challenged. I can see it from here. Before he could argue, she reached down and... What the hell? Naruto had expected many things when he met Willow again what he did not expect was this. As he looked on gobsmacked, she tucked the comb into her belt and tore her skirt. Several inches of fabric just like that his jaw threatened to come unhinged, as she took the fresh fabric and marched over to him like a woman on the warpath. Naruto tried not to look at her skirt, truly he did. 
He could have run, could have fought, could have done any number of things that didn't involve standing there like a lemming. Instead he stood still and let Willow bandage his wound. Quickly, firmly, efficiently, almost as if she had experience in this sort of thing. It almost made him smile as she fussed over him. You're stronger than you look. He took the compliment as it was while she worked, looking up at him through her long lashes. What made you that angry? Personal matters. He mumbled. Wait, were you worried about me? Naruto hadn't meant anything by those where they were harmless by all accounts. Alas, he wasn't privy to the thoughts of the Shni girl. He didn't see the way her imagination ran rampant, didn't realize his simply line of inquiry had quickened her pulse. How could he was adept at sensing negative emotions? Positive not so much. As such, he was wholly unprepared when Willow's pale face turned scarlet. And I know she sputtered out. Surely not it would just reflect poorly upon me if you were hurt while in my care. Naruto tilted his head innocently, her baffling behavior sailing over his head as surely as a bird. So you were worried. Her eyes narrowed to wintry slits. Sith, Naruto sat. Looking back, he wasn't quite sure why he obeyed that command even wounded, he knew she couldn't possibly hurt him. A tiny voice in the back of his head told him she wouldn't. Yet some dread instinct seized a hold of his legs all the same and before he knew it, he was sitting back on the large seat before the mirror again. Something told him it would be in his best interest not to move for the next five minutes. And if Kurama was nigh but hooting with laughter in the back of his mind, then he did his best to ignore the bastard. His suspicions proved correct when Willow descended on him with the brush a heartbeat later. Say what you would about her bedside manner, but the woman wielded a comb like a weapon. By the time Naruto realized what she intended it was already too late to escape. She silently slid behind him and he glimpsed only the faintest smile before she went to work on his hair which was admittedly something of a mess, even after the bath. If anything, bathing might have made it worse. Without his head bent to tame it, that tawny mane spilled down to tickle his forehead and he had no means to master the spiky mess until now. Willow didn't just brush his hair, she attacked it but not in a way that hurt. On the contrary, this felt downright pleasant. Your hair has lost more of its color since I saw you last. She hummed softly as she worked his scalp with perfect strokes. Did something happen to you? Besides the fall his partner snarked. Inwardly, Naruto's mind began to skitter about madly. What to tell her how much did he dare and he'd lost more color how bad had it been before his hair was going to turn white at this rate wasn't there any way to reverse this he liked it the way it was outwardly. He feigned a laugh as she continued to tend to him and uttered the words he'd never thought to speak in his lifetime. It was just a one-off, something to distract his host while he got his thoughts together. He didn't give any more thought to it than he would breathing. Not in the least. I think it makes me look distinguished. It only further served to seal his fate in her eyes. Really Willow favored him with a curious look. So do I. Naruto blinked, somewhat taken aback. Huh, neat, point in his favor. They sat in companionable silence for a moment longer as she tended to his hair, neither willing to speak further. Neither knew what to say. What could they say despite the unique circumstances of their meeting, they were very much strangers from two very different worlds. They barely knew one another's names, much less likes or dislikes. Where could the conversation possibly go from here had things continued as they were? The conversation might have died then and there, dooming them to different paths. By chance, Naruto's gaze slipped to the weapon at Willow's hip. At a glance, it seemed like an impractical choice for a weapon. Who used a rapier these days much less one with what was that, a cylinder of some sort built into the guard weird. It seemed a silly weapon to use in a fight he much rather preferred his fists or the staff he'd learned to summon. Ordinarily he wasn't the sort to disparage one in their choice of armament, but for some reason he couldn't help but stare at the damn thing. Naturally, Naruto being Naruto, he said the first thing that came to mind, which meant he shoved his foot right into his mouth. You know how to use that. Mistakes were made. All at once the comb in his hair suddenly jerked him forward with violent intent and said rapier promptly came up under his chin. That silvery tip could have killed him any number of ways she could have slit his throat or cut his windpipe, even punctured his mouth in any number of ways. Instead the rapier simply hovered beneath his chin, raising his gaze to meet that of its mistress. All the while, Willow didn't emit so much as an iota of killer intent. It was only that in her smile that stopped him from slapping the weapon aside and escaping outright. Would you care to rephrase that question, good sir she hummed. Her will, her posture, the arctic defiance roaring high in her eyes all of it bespoke of training. She was a fighter, if not a warrior. A strange glyph of some sort shimmered at her back and he wasn't at all eager to find out if it was lethal or not. Or what it did, for that matter. So rather than bolt and leap out the window like any sane person would he chose to laugh. And when he did, her frigid look melted like so much thin ice. Maybe this girl wasn't so bad after all. Maybe she just needed someone to talk to. He could do that. He liked talking. Nope this time when Naruto smiled, it truly felt genuine almost like coming back to life. Question answered. Excellent. Quick as a flash, Willow returned it to her belt. I didn't want to blacken Sable with your blood. Sable the Jinchuriki blinked, incredulous. You named your weapon. Her cheeks took on a faint pink tinge. Is it a problem? Yes, Kurama groaned into a paw. So much yes. No way Naruto took her hand. That's awesome. Her blush deepened. Just a touch. You think so? Does everyone do that here he asked. Willow tilted her head. Here, Naruto hesitated. Well, Willow must have sensed his fear because she closed the gap between them. 
Naruto watched her like a hawk as she settled in beside him, all the while aware of her abilities. This was no delicate wallflower, no maiden to be poked and prodded. Here sat a warrior. Would it be so bad to tell her surely she wouldn't betray his trust? She had no reason to do so. Even if she did turn on him for reasons he'd yet to understand, he had the measure of her now. He wouldn't be caught off guard like that again. If it came to a fight, he'd win probably. So he said it. I'm not from around here. Her fingers squeezed his, gentle but firm. He wasn't prepared for her smile. I gathered that much when you fell out of the sky. Ha ah, despite his best efforts, an incredulous laugh burst out of him. Yeah, I did do that, didn't I? Are you from Vacuo? Then Willow asked politely, misunderstanding what he'd just said to her. Vale Mistral, try farther. Naruto grimaced. Farther north. Farther as in another world. His head drooped. Pale eyes widened, her lips parting just so. Now came the moment of truth. You're not lying, are you? B-A-H-A-H-A-H-A. Naruto couldn't help himself raucous laughter burst out of him as he crashed backward in disbelief, toppling from their shared seat with a great and mighty guffaw. Willow lost her grip on his hand, but Naruto couldn't be bothered to care. Why had he been so concerned in the first place he'd been so wound up, so afraid, and for what Willow hadn't rejected him? She hadn't even batted an eyelash or tried to move away, though she was frowning. It was enough. All the tension rushed out of him at once, dashed upon the stoic expression the young Shnee brought to bear. That settled things. He liked her. If you're not telling the truth, I'm going to be very cross with you. She warned. Look. He wheezed out a final laugh, unable to hold himself back any longer. I'm no good with words but I'm kinda lost. I was hoping you'd help me out. Maybe. For the second time in as many days, Willow's heart beat traitorously and her chest pulse pounding with rising heat in her cheeks. Here he was, asking her for help again. He didn't care that she was a Shnee. Spirits, he didn't even seem to know what her name meant or what such a favor might entail. And he was holding her hand just how bold was he had he been living under a rock or something still. She couldn't bring herself to tug her hand from his. It felt warm, like she was holding living fire in her palm. A small, girlish part of her warmed to it. Unconsciously, her fingers began to twine with his as she cast a furtive glance to the door. Maybe this wouldn't be so bad after all. So long as father didn't see this just now, father would get protective. Well, if you insist. She feigned a scowl for appearance's sake. What did you want to know? Everything. In his defense, Naruto didn't mean to pull so hard when he grabbed her hand again, nor could he be wholly blamed for the disaster that followed. But it happened anyway. With only one arm to act on and no way of controlling his strength at the moment, he went from tugging the silent Shnee to all but hauling her down to him on the floor. She landed squarely in the middle of his lap. All her thoughts went unwound, her body going rigid immediately. Still he barreled on, ignorant of the reaction he'd provoked in her, continuing to chatter away as she squirmed helplessly in his grasp. I want to know everything about this world why is this city in the sky all the while? Willow's face turned nearly incandescent. What are those giant metal machines why are there women with rabbit ears and men with tails? Willow tried to reply, tried to muster her defenses and speak. It was too much, too sudden, too soon. All that emerged was a soft, H-H-H-H, my dear. And then things got worse, so much worse. All at once, the door to her quarters crashed open with a resounding bang. Naruto's first impression of Nicholas Schnee otherwise known as Willow's father would doubtlessly be a simple one in that he was an absolute bear of a man an absolute marvel of masculinity with long white hair alongside a bushy beard. Judging by the way he tilted his head, it didn't take long to put two and two together. He likely saw the relation to Willow in his face, if not his mannerisms. His attire, less so. He wore a heavy, ornate suit of armor reminiscent to that of a knight with a black shirt and pants underneath, coupled by a red fur-trimmed cloak held by a gold cord. Even trapped as she was, she watched her patient stiffen slightly at the sight of him. Unfortunately, the man looked fit to murder him right now. Ah, so this must be Naruto. His smile had far too many teeth. My daughter's been taking care of you for quite some time. I can't but notice you've been doing the same. His gaze drifted lower, to their intertwined fingers, to Willow even now still sitting in Naruto's lap. Seeing her torn skirt, however that sent father roaring right over the edge. How kind of you. The doorknob creaked ominously in his grasp. Daddy wait don't kill him it's not what it looks like without thinking Willow leaped out of Naruto's lap and threw herself before her father's mercy, accidentally defaulting to the phrase she'd used as a little girl. She hadn't called him that in ages now. He noticed too, damn him judging by the gobsmacked expression he wore. It was swiftly followed by a dopey grin, one she remembered all too well from her childhood days. Too late, Willow realized her mistake too late, she recalled just how sentimental he could be. No, he wouldn't do that here. Not again. No, surely not. He wouldn't he did. Oh, Willow my dear, my daughter, my greatest joy in the world arms like bands of iron locked around her waist and hoisted her into the air with ease. I knew you cared. Willow refused to show the silent smile in her heart. For a moment she almost felt like a little girl again it reminded her of simpler times. Happier times. Gods this was embarrassing. Humiliating. Oddly comforting. Then she remembered just who was watching and her comfort turned to sullen dismay. Frankly she preferred her father's anger compared to this utter mortification. Even now she could feel the incredulous eyes of her guest upon her. Did he snicker just now she was never going to live this down, was she? Hold on. Thankfully, Naruto chose that moment to climb to his feet and chime in. Just how long was I out for? 
That long, Willow glanced aside in a cold sweat, still wriggling in her father's grasp. Only a few days. A few the young man twitched at her choice of words. Wait a minute to how many is a few too? Five, Nicholas put in pleasantly, still squeezing her tightly. He gave her quite the scare. Willow whined. Daddy. Aha, Nicholas crowed, rubbing his scruffy face against hers. He said it again. Willow honestly considered stabbing him with Sable. Thankfully, her father chose that moment to release her before she could contemplate patricide. Willow didn't even need her semblance to bolt to the other side of the room her legs did that for her. Unfortunately, Naruto was on the other side of the room and her little escape attempt brought them full circle once more. Without a determined daughter to cuddle, Father Nicholas, she reminded herself was free to focus his attention on the whiskered warrior once more. And oh did he focus. His gray gaze flicked up and down the boy's body, as though he were actively inspecting him for thought a spark shot through his gaze just now. Surely that was her imagination. He considered Naruto for a long moment, then longer yet still, before he spoke. Very well then. I think I understand your intentions towards my daughter. Wait, what who Naruto blinked owlishly. You do. You do Willow mirrored him with a gulp. No no no. This wasn't happening. Of course, my dear girl it's impossible to miss the way you've been staring at one another father's laughter might have been pleasant. But for the edge in his gaze and the tiny sapphire glyph dancing in his palm. Then his gaze found Naruto. You should know that I value my daughter's happiness more than my own life. He continued, laying one hand to the hilt of the sword even now resting in his belt. Disproportionately so. Maybe if she threw herself at the wall she could knock herself out. It had to be better than this. Of course. The blonde chirruped, the meaning sailing clear over his head. It's not like I'm gonna stab her in the back or anything, if that's what you mean. I like her. Sadly, her aura held when she headbutted the wall. Would you die for her Nicholas challenge with an arched eyebrow? Something in Naruto's gaze hardened and Willow flinched. What kind of question is that? Oh, thank goodness. Either he was horribly dense, or was willfully ignoring the question. She wasn't sure she liked either. She saved my life. And then he made it worse, blast him so much worse dying wouldn't even begin to repay the debt I owe her. That's grand the older man beamed. Have you picked out a ring for her yet? Willow keened quietly as she worried her lip between her teeth. Naruto frowned. Ring why would I need a ring? Are you a bold one father boomed. While that tore at the Shni heiress took her head between both hands and tried to hide in her palms while they talked. This was happening. She'd lost control of this train and it was hurtling a fiery death at the end of the tracks. Maybe she should just jump through the window and fling herself to her demise. It sounded less painful than the sheer embarrassment she was experiencing right now. This couldn't be happening. This was a dream. A misunderstanding. A god's awful misunderstanding. Did he think they two of them were that she and Hewards failed her? She'd fallen somehow and cracked her head. She'd wake any moment now. Excellent once again, father's smile had entirely too many teeth for her liking. I'm so glad we came to an understanding. If you hurt her well I'll just have to kill you. Here, a spark of anger flashed in the blonde's eyes. Why would I hurt someone precious to me? Willow nearly passed out then and there. Wonderful as she looked on through half-lidded eyes and her own pounding pulse, father stepped forward and clapped Naruto on the back with enough force to stagger a Beowulf to the younger man's credit. He didn't budge an inch. Never you mind about that arm of yours. The jolly man prattled on. We'll have you fitted with a prosthetic in no time I know a fine scientist who will get you up to speed. He's a bit erratic, but there's no greater mind here in Atlas. That's really not necessary. I insist came the guffaw. Think of it as a gift for my son-in-law. Here at last, comprehension dawned in Naruto's eyes. Rather than protest, it seemed to strike him speechless. Willow took a certain vindictive pleasure when his gaze sought her out had she been in her right mind. She would have deliberately looked away and left him to dangle before father like a choice cut. Whatever fleeting feelings Naruto might have stirred in her, he'd made her very cross just now. Was it so wrong that a tiny part of her soul wanted him to suffer as she had a wiser woman would have done just that, step back, and let nature take its course? Alas, she was far too flustered to do think coherently. Daddy, no she wailed, trying one last time to make her father see sense. This is a misunderstanding. Daddy, yes Nicholas Schnee cackled. Welcome to the family, my boy. I'm honored Naruto croaked out. She wanted to throttle him. Remarkably, father came to his rescue. Speaking of family, young Jack has been waiting in the foyer for the better part of a day now. Nicholas's expression turned contemplative as his daughter wrinkled her nose at the mere mention of entertaining another man. As though she'd just smelled something incredibly foul. But I suppose there's not much point in entertaining him now, is there, dear daughter? Willow's head slammed into a wall. Absolutely not. I understand, my dear. I'll send him away. She blinked. Just like that. No, she said. No, I'll do it myself. Perhaps this was for the best. She was a schnee. The SDC would fall to her someday. She could not simply let father handle every task for her. She would simply tell Jack she had no interest in a relationship liar, liar, an insidious voice crooned in the back of her head at this moment in time. Best to make it clear to this man, lest he think something untoward. Gods, she was dreading this, but she accepted the necessity all the same. Father clearly had his mind made up, nothing else could possibly convince him. And now she'd have to turn down another suitor and all that ugly business. Unless, are you certain? Father asked. Yes, quite. She beamed. I'll handle it. An ugly thought reared itself in the back of her head even as her mouth opened. 
She closed it with a small smile. No, not an ugly thought. A beautiful one. A handsome thought with blonde hair and blue eyes. What did she have to lose in for a lien, in for a pound as the saying went? Besides, this would make it all the easier to rid herself of any suitors while twisting the arm of the man who bloody launched her into this situation in the first place. It wasn't that Willow disliked Naruto, mind you. Far from it. She found him quite pleasant, if a tad dense. She suspected they could grow to be friends then perhaps, with time and luck. Something more. She did not, however, fancy this misunderstanding that had been forced upon them. But she wasn't above using it to her advantage. Ashni did what they must, after all. So she waited patiently for father to finally depart. Then her gaze snapped to Naruto like a laser. Why are you looking at me like that? Willow seized his hand. Come with me. Priceless. If there were a better word to describe Jack Jeel and his mortified expression when he saw them, Willow couldn't find it. She'd seek satisfaction where she could today. If that meant taking the piss out some poor fool who sought to win her hand, well she'd take what she could get. True enough. The young man was pleasant enough to look at in a gaunt sort of way pale features and dark hair with keen eyes and a thin mustache, all wrapped in a gunmetal gray suit. Thankfully he wasn't wearing white. That would have been presumptuous of him at best, outright arrogant at best. Naruto cleaned up better. He ought to, considering Willow had all but stuffed the sullen shinobi into one of her father's better suits. A white, double-breasted blazer with a navy handkerchief in the breast pocket. Underneath, he wore a blood-red dress shirt, vest and a black tion she'd tied herself after fixing one of his sleeves, to accommodate his missing limb. He carried himself well enough, he certainly had the looks and acumen for it coupled with his fading blonde hair which would likely be pure white someday to cut an intimidating figure. Now if only he'd stop squirming and stand up straight. I don't like this, he grumbled in her ear. Neither do I, she groused back. Just bear with it for a bit. He muttered something that sounded like a curse. Me and my big mouth. It's your mouth I'm counting on. Her lips brushed his ear. Remember, exactly as we agreed. So I just have to be an asshole for the next five minutes. He murmured. Fine, I'll just act like Madara. Who the hell is Madara? Willow whispered. He grinned at her. You'll see. At a loss, she squeezed his hand and descended the steps this being the signal for their roost to begin. She felt the softest sigh brush the back of her neck, but the blonde played his part and stepped closer to her, hip brushing up against hers as he matched her step for step in their shared march to destruction. His now gloved hand the better to disguise the bandage there seared warmly within her grasp, almost seeming to shimmer with golden flames when she risked a glance at it. Surely that was her imagination. He claimed to be from another world. Maybe that had something to do with it. She'd deal with that kind of worms later. For now, let's get this over with. You must be Jack. She raised her voice as they descended the stairs, together willing herself to speak. Did you have some business with us? Us. All part of her strategy. An attack on the man's ego designed to push him back and leave him off Balanceal at ease for the duration of his stay. Judging by the telltale twitch of the man's thin mustache, it was already working far better than she could have hoped. Naruto's presence had thrown him off, and she aimed to keep it that way. She couldn't afford to give Jack a single moment to think, much less collect his thoughts. Sure enough, the man made a squelching sound and tried to rally. Miss Willow, I wasn't aware you had a guest. She mustered the most frigid smile she could. That's Miss Schnee to you. You will address me as such. His eyes raked over her for a moment, and a cold pit of distaste opened in her stomach. Just as Naruto had been gang-pressed into a suit, so too was Willow forced to wear a dress and didn't that just burn to complete the ruse. She couldn't well wear her old outfit now. Not after she'd torn strips out of it to bandage the blonde's hand. Some might call it tasteful, but she felt naked in it. No, she loathed every bit of it, hated the way it clung to her hips and bosom, despised that it left her shoulders bare and her hair down, abhorred the thigh-high slit that gave anyone who looked a glimpse at her long's legs. Honestly, if it weren't for the faint blue shawl in Naruto's hand and hers, she would have gone into a stabbing frenzy by now. She felt almost exposed without Sable at her side, trapped in this little blue number that had once belonged to her mother. Gods, mother what would she think of her now no? Don't think about that. Mother would love this. Oh goody, Jack was winding up to speak again. And who is this man? Naruto clicked his tongue. You're better, for one. Jack jerked in place, while Willow beamed with silent pride. Perfect. He was performing just as she'd asked begged him to do. For the purpose of this brief exchange Naruto was to be arrogant, overbearing, and so annoying. In short, he had to be anything but himself for the next five minutes. Enough to drive Jack away. Humiliate him if needs be, rebuff his affections. Crush his hopes so utterly that he'd never dare to think of approaching her again. From there, word would spread. Willow Schnee was not to be trifled with she was taken. If she couldn't make father see sense that lovable dolt then she'd simply ride his assumptions and let him believe what he would, but for her own ends. And if it kept potential suitors away all the better. Naruto seemed a sweet soul, but she wasn't interested in marrying any oh not just yet. This is Naruto Yuzumaki, my intended. She smiled sweetly as she stepped between them. I don't believe you met him. Jack looked like he'd sucked on a lemon. I see. Yuzumaki, was it I've not heard the name before. It's foreign. Willow lied through her teeth, biting back a curse of her own. Quite foreign. Another world level of foreign, a small hysteric part of her mind babbled. How did the two of you meet Jack probed right back. Naruto didn't bat an eyelash. 
fell out of the sky. Willow hissed and stomped on his boot. Very well, keep your secrets. Mastering herself, Willow turned to find Naruto had skirted around her and taken the initiative again, albeit not quite in the way she'd hoped he would. Though his hand was still locked firmly in hers, his blue eyes had an edge to them, one that hadn't been there before. His eyes seemed to pulse red for a moment Jack caught it too and shrank back half a step, fear in his gait. Is there a problem he asked, adjusting his tie. Yeah, it's you, the blonde muttered. You reek of negativity. Badly, can't you smell it? Before their eyes, Jack's face turned an alarming shade of puce. WHWH why you insolent shit? I don't even know what that means. Naruto yawned. And more insults out with it already, man. We don't have all day. Jack tried puffed himself up, rather difficult considering he had almost no muscle mass whatsoever. Willowarm, Miss Schnee you can't possibly countenance this. For a moment, just a moment, she almost considered helping Jack. True, the decent thing would be to calm Naruto down right now. A thorn of doubt pricked her heart and held her back at the last second. She had an ill feeling about this man. She couldn't put her finger on it, couldn't quantify the silent shiver of dread she experienced just now. Regardless, she made up her mind. No, I can and I do. She feigned a shrug. I apologize, my fiancé is rather protective. Naruto actually paused to wrap his arm around her waist. What can I say, she's a keeper, this one. Okay, now he was laying it on thick. Jack looked between the two of them, his pride and ego bruised, and made a foolish decision. A most foolish decision indeed. Willow watched him plant his feet and wondered if he was actually going to be so foolish as to swing at Naruto. But no, he did something worse. Rather than strike physically, he thrust an indignant finger at her and struck out with his words. I wasn't aware you'd been claimed by a cripple. He just realized that. Naruto sucked in a breath through his teeth and Willow nearly reached for Sable, only to remember she'd left her weapon behind. Blasted appearances. No, ignore him. It was just a parting shot. Jack realized he'd all but dashed his chances and he was just trying to rile them up. She felt her blonde partner tense against her, but rather than lash out, he simply looked over his shoulder. And I wasn't aware, even from here she saw his lip curl in distaste, that you were such a shameless shit. Excuse me Jack roared. Did I stutter Naruto shot back? Just leave already, would you can't you see you're not wanted here. Perhaps it was father's absence, perhaps Naruto had simply riled him beyond measure. Perhaps he had simply been waiting for too long she hadn't even known he was here until a few hours ago and his pride couldn't stomach an insult, no matter how petty. Whatever the case, he didn't hesitate to rise to the bait. With a growl, he cocked his head and reared back. Naruto didn't even deign to defend himself. The punch, when it came, was clumsy by all accounts. It did not even turn his cheek indeed, the whiskered warrior didn't even deign to bat an eyelash at Jack in his feeble attack. Naruto sighed. Are you done look, just go. Jack spat right in face. To the untrained eye, it appeared the blonde would ignore this insult just as he'd ignored everything else. Willow knew better. She felt Naruto's fingers twitch when they retracted from her waist beheld the curious gleam in those blue eyes and the faintest downturning of his lips. His lone hand rose and plucked the handkerchief from his suit, dabbing the saliva away from his face. Then he went terribly still, almost as if he'd ceased to breathe for a moment. You're the one who isn't wanted, boy. Jack sneered, unwittingly twisting the knife. Why, I have half a mind to sue you for such baseless slander. Naruto's open palm cracked across the man's face like a storm, sending Jack stumbling away like a drunkard at last call. Hot damn a tiny voice whispered in the back of Willow's head at the sight. Again quick, do it again. Oh, I'm sorry. Naruto hummed, storming after him. My hand slipped just now. Jack rounded on him, livid. Why, you impudent pup. Oops slipped again. Thus did the harsh crack of an open palm echo anew, punctuated by the another shriek from Jack. He was still stumbling when Naruto seized him by his jacket and struck again. A lone palm slammed down on the right side of the man's head, deafening him to the world. A cross to his left cheek sent Jack spinning and a knee between the shoulders laid him out flat against the floor. This time, however, a curious clattering sound drew all eyes to said tiles. It damned Jack further. Willow blinked. Jack squeaked and clutched at where his tie had been. Naruto whistled. Wow, he drawled out the word. So you wear a clip-on tie, too as if you weren't greasy enough. You brute spittle frothed at the man's swollen lips. This will not stab W-A-R-G-H. Oops slipped again and again. Again. Willow didn't smile. No, surely not. She did. A lot. Who am I kidding now let's not get overzealous here, pal. Naruto raised his fist again for emphasis and the battered man crawled toward the door with a whimper, cradling his no-swollen face in his good hand. Your emotions let me read you like a book. You've always been a huge piece of shit. If I could kill you, I would. There could be no mistaking the vivid gleam in his eyes now. But I'm pretty sure that's frowned upon here, and my lady friend wouldn't like that. Now, get out. Jack got. Well, it was more of a limping stumble that carried him toward the open doors before Naruto kicked him through them and down the steps but credit where it was due. Willow wanted to make an impression. Now her wish was granted. If anyone were foolish enough to court her now, within days they'd gladly think otherwise. Granted, she hadn't intended to make such a forceful impression on her potential suitors, but she couldn't bring her heart to be dissatisfied with this result either. Jack had chosen to escalate things and received his comeuppance in turn. 
She felt free, freer than she'd felt in an age. Her release might not be immediate, it would yet take time for word to spread through Atlas and the other kingdoms, but the deed was done. She'd likely never have to deal with men or women seeking her hand ever again. And if any tried, they could easily be deterred by her so-called fiancé, whom she may or may not be falling for. It wasn't a brilliant plan. It wasn't even a very good one. But it was her plan, one of the first things Willow had decided for herself in an age, and that made her happy. That just left him. She'd tackle that obstacle eventually. Later. Much later. But for now celebration. Reluctantly, she turned. Naruto grinned at her. Nailed it. Willow stifled a laugh. Close enough. Smiling, she stepped up to link an arm in his. He didn't make any attempt to shake himself loose. Yes, this size was going to be a beautiful partnership. And if her selfish little plan changed, Ramantha was she to know. Hey, and hope you enjoyed that. We'll see Summer and Co. sooner than you think. Including it here would have felt rushed. Really, you aren't this is going to be one of my larger character-driven stories. Right up there with remnant of a shinobi and a bit of bread. But unlike those two, the changes start early here, so much so that the everything's going to be affected, for good or ill. Oh trust me, we're going to see everyone in this tale. Summer, Raven, Tai, Kuro, Kali, even Salem at one point. Not to mention all the others as we move into the actual events of RWBY itself. Speaking of which, better watch out, Salem. EX rank charisma might steal some of your allies before you even meet them. Tyrion's a lost cause, but recall that we're in Atlas. Watts is still in Atlas at this time. Who knows Naruto won't be stuck in Atlas forever, either. This story's going to span all the kingdoms and then some. Of course, once many realize what he can do, they'll be rather keen to keep him. Without Jack at the helm, the SDC might not have gone the way it did. Willow and Naruto certainly won't stand for it. Which means the White Fang won't turn out quite somnolent. Naturally this won't be an instaffix because the Shni Dust Company wasn't the only problem. Just one of the larger ones. As for pairing Snope, not telling yet. In fact, I've even created a poll on my profile. Give it a look and a vote after you review, will you? Or you could just vote via review. Most folks do, these days. Reviews are all that keep this sick man going these days they truly brighten my day. So in the immortal words of Atlas, review, would you kindly, and enjoy the previews. Surprise, surprise. You poor fool you can't protect them all. I can bloody well try. That churl they hadn't seen the last of Jack Geel. In the end, it's about trust. He stood. I didn't get your name. His ally extended an arm. James. James Ironwood. Thanks for the assist. Don't mention it. Naruto shook without thinking. More fool he. The man had a grip just like his name. That trick you did with the clones, the general frowned, just how many can you make? Alas, Naruto didn't even pause to consider his answer. I dunno. Hundreds thousands never really tested my limits. James choked, his mind already worrying at the implications. If what he said was truth I's individual was a one-man army. Atlas needed this. Begin the test. Unchained at last, the grim struck, but its fangs found no purchase upon the flesh it sought. Naruto's new metal arm held firm, half-sheathed in a glowing shroud of chakra. With a flick of the wrist, a wall of explosive sound burst forth, sending the towering grim yowling backwards. The blonde blinked, mildly bemused by the sight. Another flick produced a blade. Still smiling, he leaped forward out and swept the Beowulf's head clean off its shoulders. The second fared little better crashing against a shield that snapped into a spear to tear through its chest, while the third met its end under a crushing axe wreathed in flame. Naruto whistled. I think I'm in love. Kurama purred. Together, they raised his false arm with a small chuckle. Arthur, he called out, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. If a young Arthur Watts preened at the praise, he didn't notice. Or perhaps he did. Who can say? I knew you'd like it. His new ally pulled a diagram for him to inspect. Now then how do you feel about a grappling hook? How do I feel blue eyes lit up? I feel strongly about it. What else you got I want to put this puppy through her paces while we can, you know. Brilliant the scientist beamed, happier for the attention. I've drawn up a few designs you might be interested in. Sky's the limit, as they say. For example, if you look here. Care to dance? Naruto dithered. I don't know how. Willow's smile was decidedly coy. Experience is the best teacher. And experience also dictates a shooty IK he couldn't finish before she hauled him away. I don't want to fight you. Raven tilted her head with a grin. Too bad. That was all he heard before her sword slammed into his metal arm. What is it with girls in this world and trying to carve me up I'm not a piece of meat off? Raven never had a chance to respond because clenched knuckles slammed up into her chin and sent her spinning. Naruto took on a boxing stance. You know what, fine. I'm in a foul mood anyway. See me, birdie. I'll make fried chicken out of you. Raven's smile turned feral as she climbed to her feet and retrieved her weapon by the wayside. Yes, there's the attitude I wanted to see. Fight me. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. What you've gotta take the hits. When the world hits you hit back. 
If it tries to beat you down, knock it right on its smug ass. Take everything it has and laugh. That's what it means to live. Modified Rocky quote. Here there be monsters. Willow. Summer. W-I-L-L-O-O-W. Silver eyes lit up like sparks. A small body all but launched itself forward. Summer Rose was a white cloaked ballistic heat-seeking missile in human form. There could be no escape. Once she locked onto you that was it. You were screwed. Willow couldn't think of any other explanation for her old friend when she cannoned into her and latched onto her chest like a limpet. To this day, she still wasn't sure what her friend's semblance was. It could be speed-based, but it may bloody well be super strength. Both even. Gods, the girl hugged hard. How could someone so small be so strong? No. More importantly, what are you doing here? I missed you. The dark-haired girl beamed, as though it explained everything. Did you miss me? I gathered that, Willow said as she wriggled free with a grunt, and yes, I did miss you. But why? Are you? Here. To her credit, Summer managed to look sheepish. Which she wasn't. Ever. Well, that's a long story. She tiled her head. Why are you here? By the brothers this girl was going to drive her mad. Willow sighed with the patience of one who knew Summer Rose all too well. Summer, this is Atlas. I live here, remember? Oh, right. The smaller girl knuckled her head. Oops. A faint smile tugged at Willow's lips. You are still such a dolt. Willow Schnee's acquaintance with Summer Rose was formed from a chance meeting years ago when father took her to Vale for business. Be it by chance, happenstance, or just bad bloody luck on her part, she bumped into a mousy little girl with a fascination for all things weaponry. At the time she'd been agonizing over what kind of weapon she wanted to use. On a whim, Willow suggested a scythe. Said girl had promptly declared that they were besties till the end of time and that there would be no takebacks. In the end, they'd exchanged numbers and kept in contact. Willow wouldn't call it friendship, more like long-distance pen pals across continents. Aw, oh, you did miss me. All right, definitely a friendship, though she'd never admit it. Down, Summer. She growled, turning red. You know I don't do hugs. Summer's arrival served as a harsh reminder for Willow. If she wanted to pursue her dream of being a huntress, she would need to do it soon, having already delayed too long. Summer had a team of her own now, young as they were. Sooner or later, she would have to make a decision between running the SDC or pursuing a career in her own field. But now was not the time for such thoughts. No, no, the dark-haired huntress wilted her head as Willow poked her nose. Stop distracting me. I'm asking why are you here? In the lab. She gestured grandly to the enclosed space around them. Answers, please. Oh, that's simple. Ospin brought me and my team with him. Summer chirruped. Say, where's the guy who fell out of the sky she peeked past her? No avail. Is he here? Two Ospin said he would be here. Maybe on one of the lower floors. Ospin. Something clicked in the back of Willow's head. Uh huh. She reared back. So that's what this is about. Wait, wait. Summer's face turned ashen as her friend advanced upon her. You've got it all wrong. Not what ee 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 wow wow the who words. Too little, too late, Willow seized her friend's cheeks with all her might and pinched, stretching and pulling the poor girl's face from side to side as one might a rubber band. Summer bore with it about as well as one might expect from a girl her age, meaning she whined. A lot. Not that she could escape. You've got a lot of nerve showing up out of the blue like this unannounced, Missy. Summer may have wailed, but her smile never faded. I'm not so we. You will be when I'm through with you. Why was Willow here because she wanted to be? Because father kept his promises. Because Naruto was going stir-crazy being cooped up in the mansion and she didn't trust him alone with father. They had come here the three of them to meet Arthur and get her companion fitted for an artificial arm. It was meant to be a simple series of tests conducted by Arthur against a few mechanical soldiers away from prying eyes. A refresher to bring Naruto back up to speed. At least, that was the intent. Because, her so-called fiancé actually was somewhere down below preparing for the next phase of testing as their guests looked on which meant he got to escape this awkwardness while she was left to suffer and field questions in his place. She'd get him back for that. See how he liked a summer tackle to the chest. No, wait, that wasn't a good idea. Summer seemed entirely too eager to meet him. As for the rest of her team, a harsh crunch below them heralded the arrival of the man in question. All right, her false fiancé shouted from somewhere below them. Let's get this show on the road. Willow sighed. Nothing was ever simple where Naruto Yuzumaki was involved. She should have accepted that truth long ago. No, perhaps the fault lay with her this time. She had failed to anticipate several things today. The first was Arthur's enthusiasm. Who would have thought the man would go so far as to procure live grim for this test? The second was father's connections and the fact that he might have talked about the boy who fell from the sky. The third proved to be the lab itself. She thought it would be little more than a small enclosure in a room somewhere. One entrance, one exit, no surprises. No one to sneak up on them, no unannounced arrivals, nothing. Don't tell me. She groaned. You came to poach Naruto, didn't you? Summer perked up like an eager puppy. Who? Is that his name? Willow flicked her forehead. No. Bad Summer. She misjudged them. This building consisted of three large floors with separate entrances for each. One for the entrance and labs, another for testing where scientists could observe, and a third leading to the roof. Summer and her team had come traipsing through the ladder without warning. Almost as if they'd expected her. As if they'd known. Father hadn't been surprised. If anything, Nicholas Schnee was delighted to see them. 
but that was absurd. Unless, no, that was absurd. Father would never go behind her back like that. Surely not. Ha, uh, a rough voice drawled to her right as she leaned against the rail. Is that the bastard down there he doesn't look like much. Bet I could take him. Hero. Summer's elbow silenced it with a squawk. Be nice. You haven't even met him yet. All right, all right, short stack. Don't hit so hard. Willow flicked a wary glance at Kuro Branwen and felt her lip curl. Rude brute. She disliked him from the first. She supposed the same could be said of his sister. Raven hadn't spoken so much as a word since she'd met her. Summer had hinted that the Branwen twins were from a remote village or some such. They acted like former bandits. So uncivilized. At least a young Zio Long was polite enough to nod when she glanced at him. Huh, handsome fellow, that one. She liked Naruto better. And there was the Goliath in the room. Ospin, headmaster of Beacon Academy. Currently chatting up father and laughing with him as if he were an old friend. Which he was. She didn't miss the way he kept glancing down at Naruto and Arthur in the test zone below. Something told her it wasn't Watts he was interested in. He might be one of the greatest minds in Atlas, but he was also something of a known quantity. Naruto was not. The boy who fell from the sky. Willow palmed her face, of course that would catch Osmond's attention, his curiosity more so. Father had likely mentioned it in passing, and said curiosity had drawn him here. But why bring Summer and her team it didn't make any sense. She'd only met the headmaster a handful of times, enough to be wary of him. Still, she knew father's friendship with him was a tight one and couldn't bring herself to interfere. She didn't know what the two of them got up to behind closed doors with their meetings and frankly she didn't want to. It was only natural that he would have passed the news along. That shouldn't have bothered her yet it did. The realization that followed, more so. Don't tell me. She groaned at Summer. He came to poach Naruto for Beacon, didn't he? Her friend perked up like an eager puppy. We yell. Tai swooped in to swat her arm. No. Bad Summer. Aruwa. Spoil sport. I'm uh, not that bad. You are. Answer the question. Willow smiled at the byplay, but there was a hint of ice in her eyes. Is Oz been here for him or not? And to think, she hadn't anticipated an ambush at all, least of all one by an old friend, much less for said friend to drag her entire team and the headmaster of Beacon with her. Or perhaps it was the other way around this time. This was not how Willow had thought to meet Osman again, or the rest of Team STRQ. None of them. Any of them. But seeing an old friend again she wouldn't trade this for the world. Yoop. Summer chirruped, popping the pea with a loud smack. I mean it's not every day someone falls out of the sky. Do you think he can fly? And there went her good mood again. She twitched. No, I'm fairly certain he can't. Summer wrinkled her nose. Then did he fall out out of the sky or not? Again with that question. What do you think, Ray? If he's strong, then he's strong. Raven shrugged, finally speaking for the first time as she responded to Summer. If he's weak, then he's weak. We'll find out soon enough. Summer gulped. And if he's strong, then I will attempt to kill him. The faintest hint of a smile crossed Raven's face. We shall see. Well, that solidified Willow's opinion of Raven Branwen. Jury was still out on the boys, but she knew precisely what to think of this girl. Bitch. She absolutely didn't let her disdain show. Schnee were above such petty displays. Summer was someone whose opinion if not general disposition she would gladly entertain. Raven was certainly no friend of hers. Ty seemed tolerable, if she was honest with herself. Hero would Summer be made if she stabbed him just a little probably. She was still considering her approach when Arthur Watts finally deigned to climb the steps and join them. My apologies for the delay. Time waits for no man, it seems. As ever, he was the picture of decorum, dressed in a simple tan suit pausing only once to note Ospin's presence. His eyes widened briefly before he managed to mask his surprise. Indeed, he did a far better job of it than Willow had. His mustache only twitched once as he took in the whole of Team STRQ. No doubt he appreciated this unexpected opportunity and the press it provided. It wasn't every day the headmaster of Beacon dropped in for a visit. If he thought anything of Summer and her team, he did little to show it. Summer stuck her tongue out at his retreating back. After a pointed moment of consideration, he moved to stand beside her and father. He showed solidarity in that, if nothing else. Watts was an eccentric sort, but he was loyal to those who appreciated his work. Judging by his pleased expression, Naruto had just joined that short list. Good. He'd need all the allies he could get. How is he? Nicholas inquired. He's quite ready. The prodigy beamed. A hollow clang echoed below, punctuated by a roar. Nicholas couldn't help but preen at their expectant faces. Just a little. Shall we begin, then? Willow offered a silent prayer to the gods that this spectacle wouldn't end in disaster. Oh, who was she kidding? Of course it would. So that's a grim, huh? All told, Naruto had expected it to be bigger. PSSH. Hirama agreed with a snort. People fear these things I could eat that wolf in a single bite. Naruto was half tempted to agree. Oh, the creature before them was large enough to be sure, an impressive seven-foot fall specimen of black fur and white bone hammering against the barrier between them. Even from this distance he saw it, and it saw him. Those beady red eyes followed his every movement, its slavering jaw cracked wide as it stood tall on its hind legs. It knew he was there and it wanted out. He could feel the rage radiating from it in palpable waves. Violence and the hate stemming from the beast like a dark tide, and the intensity of it threatened to choke him. Who would have thought negative emotion sensing could be a bad thing? 
Clad in a pair of simple gray trousers and a navy blue sleeveless vest, the blonde began to bound on the balls of his bare feet as he awaited the go-ahead to begin. To think, they'd asked him to wear boots in here. Boots? Huh. Perhaps in another life, the sight of slavering monsters might have terrified the whiskered warrior. Now in the last week he'd stared down chakra monsters and a goddess. He'd fallen out of the sky and nearly died. He'd endured the horror of wearing clothes that weren't orange and black. Monsters his outfit was monstrous to look at. Too dull. Too drab. He'd gladly face monsters rather than wear this getup. But he still didn't like looking at the Grim, because it wasn't alone. Two of its kin kept lurked near the reinforced glass alongside their brother, each eyeing the juicy morsel lurking only yards away. They'd given up trying to break through the reinforced glass five minutes ago, but he could still see the cracks where they'd made the attempt. They knew they were going to get out, and so they had chosen to save their strength. Clever. According to his host these specimens had proven quite difficult to capture for him. They wouldn't last very long in captivity. They he, were here for the express purpose of a test, nothing more. He could respect that, even if he didn't much like the reason behind it. Are you ready, my boy? A voice echoed overhead. Naruto pumped an arm toward the ceiling in agreement. Both his arms. Let's do this. Nicholas Schnee was a man of his word. Only a few days day after humiliating Jack Jill, Naruto had found himself whisked away to a laboratory in the upper echelons of Atlas to be fitted for a prosthetic arm. Now he would be testing said arm. A shame, really. He would have liked to see more of this city beforehand rather than be cooped up in that mansion, but he understood the necessity of getting himself back into fighting shape before he took the world by storm. Willow had promised him a tour after this anyway, so there was that to look forward to. He hadn't expected to have an audience for said test, however. He'd seen them coming while he prepared. Naruto knew none of their faces, though he could see them from the second floor. They'd come in through one of the upper entrances while he was down here, preparing for the test. Two girls, two boys, each nearly of an age with him, alongside a man with silver hair bearing a cane. Friends of Willow and Nicholas he supposed. Not his concern. If they wanted to talk afterward, that was more than fine with him. For now he just wanted to get started already. Willow caught him staring and raised a hand. Naruto returned the gesture with his new addition. Luck he didn't need luck. He was ready to put this arm through its paces. Cobalt blue metal embossed with streaks of scarlet and black rose to wave at her, fingers idly flexing. Supposedly it was a marvel of Adelgen technology, or so he'd been told. Certainly felt like it. Arthur Watts was an eccentric young man to be sure, but he knew his stuff. His new limb fit like a glove. A glove he couldn't feel, but still. It responded to his thoughts flawlessly, fingers flexing in time with his motion and his muscles even now as he made a fist. Half of the man's words had flown straight over his head when he'd explained how it worked, but Naruto found himself pleased with it nonetheless. A metal arm was better than no arm at all. Hirama had proven more attentive and memorized the gibberish that followed, functions and all. Speaking of which, he spared a glance for the room. It was something of a large square space, all reinforced glass and steel with a second floor by which others could look down from within a protective barrier and observe. Which made sense, considering they were about to throw a pack of live grim at him. Watts had been the one to gather them in the first place, but he'd asked to face the beast despite everyone's concern. He wanted to know everything about this world, its people, those who stalked said people, everything. Robots wouldn't be a challenge. Grim would regardless of the risk. Are you sure about this Willow called down to him? It's not too late to back out. Heh. <sighs> he preened a bit, puffing out his chest. Just wait and see. The barrier snapped down with an audible thunk. Begin the test. Watts cried. Released at last, the nearest Grim bounded forward and struck at once, but its fangs found no purchase upon the human flesh it sought. Naruto's new metal arm rose to weather the assault, half-sheathed in a glowing shroud of chakra. In that moment, his grin was rather similar to his wolfish foe. With a flick of the wrist, a wall of explosive sound burst forth from a vent in the wrist, sending the towering Grim yowling backwards into a wall to stun it. It startled the blonde as well, earning a somewhat mild laugh from him. Huh. So that was what the button did. To press the trigger near the thumb. Watt's calm instruction came from above. That was a front of course. The man had spent the last 15 minutes drilling the arm's features into him before he'd even given him the arm. Mad scientist indeed. Some of these combinations were visceral. Thankfully, he didn't mind showing off a little for the sake of his new ally he'd promised to do this much at least so he feigned curiosity and did as he was told. Like this. Sure enough, Naruto heard something click and the vent snapped down, replaced by a serrated blade at the wrist. Rather like a kunai, but longer and sharper. All right, he could work with this. While he didn't like weapons, he'd been trained enough to use them. Still smiling, he leaped forward out and swept the Beowulf's head clean off its shoulders. Watts cheered something up above, no doubt taking a moment to espouse how useful his creation was in dispatching Grimm. Naruto paid him little mind and lunged at the second, fingers clicking into a different formation. Either unwilling or unable to learning from the mistakes of its fallen comrade, the second Grimm fared little better, it tried to meet his charge head on. A subtle pulse of chakra triggered the arm's mechanism again and its ill-advised rush stalled against a shield. Said shield soon snapped into a spear and bore through its chest. Someone squealed somewhere above, and it didn't sound like Willow at all. I want that. Why do I hear boss music? Naruto nearly missed a step and snapped a glare at the one responsible. 
Sure enough, a girl in a white cloak leaned over the railing above, silver eyes wide. There were others up there with her, but they weren't all but throwing themselves over the railing to stare at him. She caught him gaping and waved. Hi. Awkwardly, he raised his arm to wave back. Hello. Summer. Willow snatched her back with a hiss. Stop that. The remaining Grim looked about as baffled as Naruto felt, so much so that it hadn't attacked. Naruto shrugged helplessly and took on a ready stance. It perked up noticeably when he beckoned at it with a low whistle. Here, boy. With a loping roar, the beast bounded at him. Rather than take its assault head on, the blonde turned ran up the nearest wall he could find. Sure enough, his legs and chakra sustained him. Someone gasped behind him and the sound stretched his grin to sharkish proportions. Was he showing up perhaps? Just a little. He couldn't help himself at the moment. He was just too damn giddy to care for the repercussions of his actions. How long had it been since he'd had a chance to stretch his legs too long? So he kept running until he hit the ceiling. Then he ran some more. Finally, he came to a halt well above his prey. Hanging upside down, he tensed his body into a crouch and coiled himself like a spring. Finish it, or show off Kirama grinned. I'd advise the latter. Naruto laughed. Really someone's prickly today. Am I in his mind's eye? The fox rolled over and presented him with a shy-dating grin. We have an audience today, and I'd wager most of them bar Willow and her father think you're nothing more than some unlucky cripple. What's wrong with putting a few mortals in their place? Hey, mortal right here. Naruto sulked. Yes, but I find you tolerable. Reliable as ever, the prosthetic arm produced a soft whine when he flung it outward and made a fist just as Watts had instructed to trigger another function. A vicious axe sprang forth from the mechanism in the palm to replace his hand. Another flex created a spark, wreathing the edge in flame. Naruto tested it for a moment, gauging the weight and heft alike. Perhaps a bit heavier than he was used to, but he'd wielded worse before. In a seamless movement, he swept the weapon behind his back. Then he blurred. In his base form, it would have been the simplicity itself to simply drop from the ceiling and decapitate the creature. Naruto chose not to and willingly activated his cloak instead. He held it and sent a pulse of golden chakra to his legs, causing the ceiling to buckle beneath him as he pushed off at an angle and slammed into a wall. Sure enough, the Beowulf tracked the movement. Not so it followed. Hirama must have realized what he was up to, because he absolutely cackled in the back of his head. Naruto mirrored his words thought for thought. Together, they shot forward like a meteor. Let the games begin. Divided by let the games begin. To its credit, the Beowulf tried to dodge, it really, truly did. It did not succeed at all, and yipped in surprise as the Jinchuriki shot past to rake across its flank with the axe. Home claws tore through empty air as a second streak of gold slashed across its chest. Then another. A third. Fourth. Fifth. Each pass sent Naruto searing through the grim to alight against another solid surface, only to tense and bolt back again the moment he made contact. Each swipe tore another hole in the grim's hide. Each tear left the poor creature reeling like a body drunkard at last call. Left. Right. Center. Naruto didn't much care which way he went, each leap inevitably brought him back to his prey. His body caromed wildly off the ceiling and floors and walls alike, ever striking, constantly moving, little more than a golden flash to those present. In such a confined space, his speed made him king. And the king showed no mercy. In the end the grim never stood a chance, it was only just beginning to look up again when the axe finally came howling down on its head. Naruto landed atop its decaying corpse and rode it to its head to the floor with a delighted whoop. He was smiling, he realized. Laughing. It felt good to cut loose again after being cooped up for a week. Humming in soft satisfaction, he raised his false arm with a small chuckle. And that's how it's done. The shinobi boomed a laugh. I think I'm in love. Kirama purred. We're keeping this thing. On that much they agreed. Arthur, he called up. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Brilliant. Bloody good show. If a young Arthur Watts preened at the praise they'd given him, Naruto didn't notice. Or perhaps he did. Who can say he was far too busy shouting and singing their praises for the world hopper to get a good read on him anyway. Instead both tailed beast and human-like settled in to watch the young genius descended the steps with vicious haste, eyes agleam. There. He could get a better fix on him now, and that was most certainly a glimmer of pride and self-satisfaction burning his gaze now. Nothing wrong with that. He saw no harm in offering him his artificial arm. Awa, you made a friend. Shut up, whiskers. Naruto sighed. Watts latched onto his arm really needed a name for this thing like a proud uncle. Then came the questions, as he'd expected. That was incredible. That speed. Those rapid shifts. Did you plan that? No, wait, don't answer. I don't want to know. A hand snapped up before Naruto could answer and the blonde allowed the scientist to prattle on with a bemused smile. That was perfect. You made quite a showing there. In front of the Schnee family and Ospin himself. Huh. I'd like to see Ironwood ignore my project now once he hears of this. Naruto tiled his head. Ironwood never heard of him. Watts cackled. And that, my friend, makes this victory all the sweeter. He'll take notice of us after this, mark my words. Thus Watts thought of him as a friend then, if not an ally. Was that a good thing Naruto couldn't be sure. He would have sensed any ill intent on the man's part. No, it merely felt like he had something to prove. Fine by him. He was used to being the underdog these days. Why who the devil was Ironwood and why did he have the terrible feeling he'd just trod on his toes? Shrugging it off, he beamed without a hint of guile. The arm works just fine. You did good work. I knew you'd like it. 
his new ally pulled a holographic diagram for him to inspect. Now then how do you feel about a grappling hook? How do I feel blue eyes lit up like a blaze? I feel strongly about it. What else you got? I want to put this puppy through her paces while we can, you know. Shall I forward the details to your scroll, then? Naruto dug the device out of his trouser pocket and grimaced at the silver-blue casing. He barely knew how to use it at all, and at first tried to refuse, only to have the scroll forced on him all the same. According to Nicholas who insisted that he call him dad it was the latest model or some such. Willow had programmed it with her number alongside several others. She'd even taught him to use the blasted thing to a varying degree, but he loathed it all the same. Why use something like when you could just talk to someone face to face this world was weird. Can't we just talk about it now he begged hopefully as he buried the device once more. Don't make me use the scroll, Watts. It's evil. And yet you accepted that arm. The scientist arched an eyebrow. Well, yeah. The arm's a weapon. I can use an arm. I can't use a bloody phone. Capital. The scientist beamed, happier for the praise as he pulled up another screen with a flick of his fingers. I've already drawn up a few designs you might be interested in. Sky's the limit, as they say. For example, if you look here there's more than enough possibilities for another mecha shift or even. Excuse me. Whatever Watts might have said died a sputtering death as a whirling dervish of white and silver thrust itself between them with a determined shout. Naruto jerked backwards. Watts wasn't quite quick enough and found himself caught by the collar of his jacket. Ouch. He almost pitied the man. In the short time that he'd come to know him he'd realized a very cruel truth about Arthur. He did not like people in his personal space. Least of all when said people barely came up to his chest and started chattering away like a deranged chipmunk. That was amazing. Summer Rose beamed up at him with eyes full of life and light. I want one of those arms. Make me one. He what Watts reeled under the verbal assault, pride warring with incredulity. But you don't need it. Don't care. Summer pushed her forehead against his with a growl. Make me one. Watts flailed spectacularly. Help me. He mouthed at Naruto. The blonde shook his head rapidly. Not a chance. Yes, well. Watts rallied with a desperate smile. It was quite difficult for me to make. Then he threw him under the bus. Perhaps Naruto would be a better person to ask. He knows the mechanisms for more intimately than I. The blonde blanched. Liar. Traitor. Trickster. Really in that case. Summer's gaze snapped to Naruto, a guided missile ready to launch while Watts took the opportunity to scurry back to the balcony. Hey, Whiskers. Can I borrow your arm pretty please? What? Naruto squawked at the betrayal as much as the silver-eyed girl. No, buzz off. I promise I'll give it back. Summer wriggled happily. Once again, no. Naruto clutched the shinobi prosthetic to his chest, suddenly wary of this woman and her sparkling silver eyes. It wasn't fear that compelled him to do so, rather, self-preservation. Something told him this little hellion would not hesitate to rip it right off him if she thought she could get a hold of it. He was certain she is harmless. He knew he could fight her off if worse came to worse. No, he knew he could. That wasn't in question. And yet something told him to fear Summer Rose. I need an adult. Tirama whimpered. No, we need an adult. I think she qualifies as one. Naruto shot back. In what world? Came the roar. Down, short stick. Thankfully, a young man with dark hair swooped in to flick the girl's forehead, driving her back. Summer recoiled with a small whine. Naruto saw his chance for what it was and bolted. Willow met him halfway, descending the steps two at a time to link her arm in his. Her apologetic expression told him all he needed to know, more so as the Schneeris angled her body to keep herself firmly between him and this crazy lass. Who, or what, is that? He hissed, all but hiding behind the Schneeris. Where did she come from? That would be Summer. To her credit, Willow recognized his plight and winced. She's a friend. Well, your friend tried to take my arm off. Naruto bit back. Care to explain that? Her pinched expression grew more strained. She ice enthusiastic. No kidding. He deadpanned. Never would have guessed. Willow flashed him a dark look and tugged him back half a pace as the rest of Summer's entourage descended the steps. Naruto allowed it allowing him to focus on the newcomer, the better to assess her and get a feel for her emotions before the rest could swarm him. Emotions what emotions? Summer was light. There were so many words for her that he couldn't think of them all. If Willow was driven determination, then this girl was pure energy. Hope and happiness and personified, wrapped around a core of molten steel. There wasn't so much as a shred of doubt or darkness in her heart, the light burned all that away. This girl would fight for those she loved. She'd gladly give her life for them. She also wanted to make sweet, sweet love to his artificial arm after she stole it. Wait, where had that though come from Naruto wasn't even sure how he knew that, but he had a suspicion. He stole a glance for the mark on his fleshy palm and frowned when he saw it pulse a faint shade of angry red. What are you doing to me? Perhaps it had something to do with Sasuke's death and the trauma it brought him. Perhaps it was the new mark he'd been given. Perhaps it had evolved somehow, allowing him to sense positive emotions alongside the negative. Who knew this ability wasn't mind-reading by any measure, but it was a close second. He didn't want it, not when it made him read people like a book. Willow elbowed his side, claiming his attention and concern once more. Listen very carefully. Her stern words claimed his attention instantly. My father brought these people here, no don't give me that look. I don't know why. She flicked his forehead when he tried to protest. I think he wanted them to see what you were capable of. The brooding girl over there is Raven. The blonde next to her is Taeyong. The last one is Kiro. 
You've already met Summer. Try not to kill any of them. I'd be very cross with you. He nodded, but something must have shown in his expression, because her visage softened and she started stroking his arm instead. Are you alright? Her words were softer, the facade dropping for him. Father's got them distracted for the time being. We could leave, if you like. Naruto considered it, strongly. A thorn of hesitation held him back. Who's the geezer with your old man? Blast it, I forgot about him. Willow sucked in a breath, made sure the man wasn't watching, and leaned closer. That would be Ospin, headmaster of Beacon Academy. I don't know him nearly as well as I'd like to. Avoid him if you can. I think he might try to poach you for his school. No, thank you. The words were a bit louder than he intended and drew immediate attention to them. I want to stay here. With you. Her cheeks turned rosy and her fingers curled around his. That is very sweet of you. Hey there, lovebirds. Got a sick. On a whim, Naruto turned his gaze to the newcomer Kuro. He recalled his name who had just called out to them. Naruto tried not to look. He really and truly did, but his new power betrayed him. His stomach roiled at what he found there. Anxiety, a veritable ocean of it, enough to drown in. Stress and regret piled high atop each other, bundled up in a tight little ball masked behind a pained smile he never let anyone see. Torn loyalties, family and friendship. This one would have to make a choice sooner or later. His fate would hinge on Edith's with those of his unborn nieces. Nieces what the hell, again with the knowing of things he shouldn't. What was happening to him? Sorry about Summer, Naruto blinked at the words as he found the younger of the Branwen twins offering him a hand. She gets excited when it comes to weapons. He jerked a thumb over his shoulder to where a man in tan leathers was visibly restraining the eager girl. Tai and Ray are working on that. A little help here, said Blonde yelped. Nah, you've got her. Tai Washa, actually a pretty decent fellow, all things considered. His emotions were an open book for Naruto to read at his leisure. He cared for his teammates, all of them, perhaps a little too much. Now there was a revelation he could have done without. Not that he was judging. Nope, Kai could do his own thing and leave him well out of it. He wanted no part of that mess or the dark-haired woman who was suddenly looking at him like he was a piece of meat. At least she seemed to busy holding Summer down for now. Nope, nope, nope. Naruto ignored it and deleted all thoughts of it from his brain. Not touching that subject with a ten-foot pole. Kinky. A low whistle bounced off his ears. Kurama, I will end you. Seeking an escape, he turned his attention back to Kuro and lied through his teeth. I didn't get your name. Kuro Branwen. A roguish grin flashed at him. Nice Tomicha. Now the newcomer was talking to him. Damn it. He'd engage them without thinking to get away from Kurama's laughter. So much for their sweet escape. Naruto wanted to cry. Was it too late to just chuck his arm at Summer and Bolt that was beginning to seem a preferable alternative to being dragged about like this? It wasn't that he was angry at them. Far from it. Everyone here just had so much personality. He found himself overwhelmed by it. Coming from someone like him, that was saying something. Don't worry about it. So he plastered on a smile he didn't feel and willed himself to shake the man's hand. Just keep her away from my arm. Huh. That actually drew a chuckle out of the young man. Can't make any promises there. What Summer wants, Summer gets. Not always. Willow clutched his arm just a little tighter. Something clicked in the back of Naruto's mind. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Willow was jealous. Even he wasn't so dense as to miss her petulant expression, the slight shifting of her hips as she leaned into him. The why and of what Summer he'd barely spoken a few sentences to the girl. Most of those had been him trying to fend off her grabby hands. Surely she wasn't jealous of Kuro. Naruto had the strangest feeling the man would make a good friend. Stop spacing out. Hirama jabbed him. Must I do everything for you answer him. He's obviously waiting for you to respond. Naruto wrinkled his nose in mild annoyance. Well, little Miss Silver Eyes won't be getting me in my arm without a fight. The faintest sliver of understanding dawned in Kuro's gaze. Good to hear. So, you and the Ice Queen, eh? Willow made angry willow noises. Don't call me that, Birdbrain. Naruto snorted. He couldn't help himself. His body betrayed him the moment he heard the words. Ice Queen. It was funny if only because it didn't fit. Not at all. He knew Willow. Her icy persona was every bit of facade, one she had constructed with the utmost of care. She loathed it. In private she was stubborn and fussy, proud and determined and kind. She'd give you the very clothes off her back. Willow saw his expression and scowled. Not you, too. Hey, I wasn't agreeing with him. Naruto replied. You're too warm to be an ice queen. Kiro whistled. Smooth talker, this one. Sure enough, his ally turned a bright cherry red at that remark, leaving him to wonder if she had misread his intentions again. Damned words and their double meanings. Still, he'd made her happy. Hadn't he that was a good thing, right? It would make their spar all the more enjoyable later. Wait, why the devil was Kuro smirking at the two of them? What did he see? What did he know? Pretty impressive display earlier. The brand one said instead, choosing to skirt the subject entirely. Naruto let him. Where did you train? Places. Willow responded just a touch too quickly for him. Now it was Naruto's turn to glower. Places. How a knowing smirk tugged at Kuro's mouth. Never heard of it. I'm mostly self-taught. Naruto headed him off at the pass before he could press her further. It wasn't a lie. Most of what it had been on his own. He had good teachers. Just because he'd spilled the beans to Willow didn't mean he was willing to tell everyone his grand secret. Honestly, he wished Nicholas had said anything at all but he knew the man meant well at least. 
In his own bumbling way, Willow's father was probably trying to help him make friends. Naruto respected that, if nothing else. Might I have a moment, Kuro? He wasn't sure if he could say the same for Osbin. Try as he might, Naruto couldn't get a solid read on the man when he approached them. While the members of STRQ he'd seen thus far were very much an open book to his newfound gifts, this man was a vault, sealed shut which meant one of two things. Ospin was either actively masking his emotions for some reason, or he simply couldn't read them. Him. He wasn't sure which was worse, or if that was even a bad thing. The idea of being able to read people like Fish didn't like it. Felt too personal. If he was going to live with this new ability, he'd have to master it, learn to turn it on and off at the very least. Reluctantly, he accepted the hand in good faith. That was a truly impressive display, the man said. I'll be frank, we'd love to have someone like you in Beacon. Willow absolutely hissed. Now, now, old friend. Nicholas came to their rescue with a laugh as he moved to stand beside them. I'm afraid the boy's already spoken for. I asked you here to see what he was capable of, not so you could recruit him. Did you ask and quirked a brow and pointedly ignored the second half of that? I'm quite sure Ironwood wouldn't mind. Nicholas coughed meaningfully. Not Ironwood. Willow whined. Daddy, stop. The Schnee patriarch swayed on his feet. She said it again. Few seemed to catch the hint, save Kuro and Ospin. Kuro at least, he felt he could trust. The man looked reliable enough and held his tongue when Naruto glowered at him. Nor were his origins the only matter of concern here. He accepted the purpose of his ruse with Willow for now, but he didn't need someone spilling secrets across the kingdoms. Well, Ospin shrugged. Perhaps Miss Schnee then. Ice blue eyes narrowed and the temperature plummeted several degrees. It was the first overt sign of anger Naruto had ever witnessed from the burly man. Nicholas held himself well. He did not snap at Ospin. He did not lose his temper. He barely even moved. Yet despite all he'd seen and done, the blonde took a step forward in his defense. Nicholas was only half a heartbeat behind. Together, they presented a united front. Yeah, that's not happening. Quite so. My daughter's path is her own. Nicholas's words were colder than Atlas itself. She will make her own decisions. Miss Schnee Ospin ventured. Willow perked up behind them and immediately shook her head. The headmaster saw it, recognized it, and calmly ceded the field to them. A shame. In the end, he smiled and tapped his cane against the floor. Should either of you change your minds, Yoa but to ask. We'd be happy to have you both. Sure, Naruto muttered the word, not meaning it for a second. Willow had already explained what the Huntsman Academies were, and while he respected them he had no desire to visit one. Ever. Going back to school at his age no thank you. At the moment, he was more than willing to make up an excuse and escape with Willow the first chance he got. Wait. Naruto turned. What now? He growled. What else could anyone possibly want? He thought it was Summer who had spoken just now, but no. The voice was cold. Instead he found himself face to face with bloody red eyes framed by midnight tresses that rather reminded him of a raven's wing. For a moment, just a moment, something flinched in him. No, they weren't the Sharingan or any such bloodline. Though this woman was dark of hair and pale of face, she was no Acha. But her features were similar enough for him to panic, and like any true predator she'd picked up on it. He'd shown weakness and the woman pounced on it like a starving beast. You, there. She pointed a finger at him. Fight me. Kuro threw out his arms. Raven, why? She ignored her brother, pushing past him to confront Naruto. Do you accept my challenge? Who are? Naruto made the mistake of raising his gaze to meet her eyes and immediately lost himself. This woman was far too easy for him to read, if only because she wore her emotions on her sleeve. Yikes, there was just one giant tangled knot of negativity, wasn't it this one was all anger and pride, stubborn to a fault. He sensed a burning need to prove her strength in the eyes of her peers as well as herself. Yet that same grit was spiced with a hint of fear. Raven Branwen was arrogant to be sure, but her arrogance was brittle. Like glass, ready to shatter against a hard punch. For all her vaunted beliefs and strength, she was weak in spirit. She was a coward at heart, unable to trust in anything but strength, and when that failed her, when the chips were down, she would run. Time and time again. From her family, from her responsibility, from the world. If not turned from her path, her daughter would suffer for her mother's cowardice ten times over. Suffer greatly. Stop. Naruto grit his teeth and wrenched with his head and alike. Somehow the sharp motion of his neck was enough to sever his sixth sense. Unfortunately this caused Raven to mistake the motion as a nod, because she drew her blade with an flourish and took on a stance. Her eyes danced with dark glee, a wide grin stretching across her face as she brought it forward in a low sweep. Kirama made a noise of mild disgust. She reminds me entirely too much of that man. Naruto agreed wholeheartedly, even as he reeled back. Miss Branwen. Bite me, Ospin. Raven turned her head and spat. This isn't your affair. Raven, Summer's voice rose in warning, cracking with the faintest hint of concern. Bad idea. Even for you. Yeah, maybe don't do that, sis. Kuro drawled and stepped between the two of them. Little help here, Tai. Now, please. The hunter in question laid a hand on the raven's shoulder. All right, there. Let's just calm down and think this through. There's no need to. No. She snapped, and his fellow blonde flinched as though she'd physically struck him across the face. She may as well have. Don't try to stop me, Tai. I'll not be denied this. Naruto twitched. Her attitude reminded him of a younger Sasuke, angry and hungry for power and the accolades it brought. 
This girl was not quite the same, but he found himself forming an immediate dislike of her all the same. Weakness strength who lived their life by such definition who fought for the sake of fighting apparently this woman did. He wasn't sure he liked that. No, fighting her would have been a bad idea without all the crap he was going through. Now it would be far too easy to stir up his emotions and do something he'd regret. I don't want to fight you, he said as much. Raven tilted her head with a grin. What's wrong afraid of me? Her words punched a big hole right through the brick wall of his resolve. Afraid of her? No, not at all. He was afraid of what he might do to her if he let his temper get the better of him. If there was one thing he couldn't stand, it was arrogance. Something about this girl just rubbed him the wrong way, made him want to slap the smile from her face. Don't. Willow saw what he was about to do and stepped to his side in an instant. She's baiting you. You can't afford to make a scene there. Her words were like a rush of cool water against his senses. There was a bitter irony there, if Willow of all people was trying to hold him back. When roused, her temper burned even hotter than his. Yet here she was, the voice of reason. Why hadn't Nicholas said anything he seemed almost bemused by their bickering, but he hadn't said a word for some time now. Had he known Willow would interfere probably. Sensing the weight of his regard, the Schnee patriarch spread his arms and stepped forward while Willow led him away. I think that's enough for today. He spoke soothingly as the two of them retreated. I can put the lot of you up in the mansion until tomorrow. Hospin smiled. Thank you for your hospitality. We'll gladly accept it. Summer and Taeyong bowed. Kuro simply shrugged. They almost made it. You would have the Schnee control you raven sneered at Naruto's retreating shoulders. Weakling, I thought you were stronger than that. Willow stilled. My name is Willow, and she has changed her mind. She released really stepped back thrice as sharply. Naruto. Against his better judgment, Naruto turned towards his friend and arched an eyebrow. Hmm. Destroy her. We can go down to Mantle once you've taken out the trash. Great. Enable me, why don't you? In hindsight, Naruto knew he could have stepped back. Restrained himself. Paused to reassess the situation. He really, really should have, Lord knew he'd drawn more than enough attention to himself already with his skill and grandstanding. But he didn't know this woman. She was a stranger to him, and moreover, she'd mocked him out of the blue and demanded a fight. For what seeking nothing more than to prove her strength. Under any other circumstance, pity and confusion would have stayed his hand, but her words banished any hope of that. Are you going to fight, or not Raven planted a hand on her hip and leaned forward. I don't have all day. Fight me, if you dare. He'd heard them before. They haunted him, even now. Those words. Those damn words. In an instant he found himself back on the rooftop, staring into a smug visage not unlike her own. It vanished when he blinked, but the rage remained. Those bloody words. Everything had gone wrong with those damned words. If only he'd seen. If only he'd realized. But he hadn't. He'd been a blind boy, and his blindness led to his friend's death years later. He'd thought himself over this. Days had passed since his first breakdown, and he'd been just fine. Hey. Naruto blew out an angry, trembling breath. Don't say that. Raven stopped short, frowning. What? Don't use his words. Whose words? The blackhead scoffed. They're mine. Now shut up and fight. Raven lunged at him in response, sweeping low and hard at his legs with her katana. Naruto leaped over the blade and for a fleeting instant, both heels alighted on the tip of the sword, leaving him glaring down at his less than pleased opponent. Her expression turned thunderous and he flipped back off it when she wrenched her weapon away. He wasn't surprised when she leaped at him, trying to carve a brutal crosscut into his chest. She still missed all the same. She was skilled to be sure, but that was all. Just skilled. He'd fought gods, and this girl, despite her high opinion of herself, was no god. When her sword swung at him again, he slapped it away with a hand. Stop. The word was a growl. I won't fight you. She sneered at him. Then you're weak. Too weak to save your friend. She hadn't said that. But he'd felt it all the same. By the log, she really was just like Sasuke, not the self-sacrificing hero he'd been at the end, but as he was before. Prideful. Arrogant. Seeking out a fight for no reason but to test herself. She looked nothing like him, but she had his old attitude down to a T. It didn't help that she had dark hair and red eyes. Nothing would dissuade her from this fight. Not her friends, not her family. Not even him. Any refusal on his part would just lead her to keep goading him. In all honesty, she had already gotten under his skin with that last remark. She sullied his memory with those words and Naruto felt his temper blaze back as he skittered out of harm's way. Last chance, he rasped. If you don't stop, I'll make you. Those hateful red eyes danced with euphoria. You're welcome to try, weakling. That was all he heard before her sword slammed into his metal arm with a keening cry. He'd expected the blade to bite deep into the steel, to his surprise it held firm. His temper less so. Blue eyes burned red. An ugly emotion reared its head in his heart all over again as he pushed back against the blade even now bearing at his head. It wasn't even a struggle. More an annoyance, really. No, it was her. She wanted a fight, did she fine. She'd get one, but not in the way she expected. What is it with girls in this world and trying to carve me up? I'm not a piece of meat. Off. Raven never had a chance to respond, because clenched knuckles slammed up into her chin and sent her spitting. Naruto took on a boxing stance. You know what, fine. I'm in a foul mood anyway. See me, birdbrain. I'll make fried chicken out of you. Raven's smile turned feral as she climbed to her feet and retrieved her weapon by the wayside. Yes, there's the attitude I wanted to see. 
fight me. When next Raven struck at him, Naruto finally stopped dodging and retaliated in kind. Clenched knuckles barreled straight through the middle of Raven's sword and shattered it like brittle glass, leaving her clutching the blade's ruined hilt. One of those flailing shards tumbled through the air to cut across her pale forehead, drawing a thin scarlet line along the length of her brow. In vain, she sought her scabbard to draw a new one, only to find herself grasping at empty air as he ripped it away from her with a roar. This close into her guard, Naruto had time enough to watch those bloody red eyes widen in surprise, to see full lips part into a small oval of confusion as he closed the distance. Then he was upon her, seizing the huntress by the shoulders to hold her fast as he drove his knee into her unprotected stomach. He was more than prepared for the brief resistance her aura gave. He tore right through it like a wet paper bag and Raven folded over the blow with a soft squeak of surprise, eyes bulging. She was still doubled over, still retching for air, when Naruto seized her by the hair and jerked her upright. Blue eyes met red as his forehead rang her skull like a gong. It rattled Raven's very world. That first punch had nearly burst her lungs, the headbutt that followed actually knocked her out for a second. It was only through sheer willpower that Raven regained her consciousness and kept her footing when he let go of her. Even then she was fairly certain he'd given her a concussion. It made her blood sing. He'd shattered Omen with a single punch and sent her scabbard flying across the room like a child's toy. She knew that she wouldn't be able to reach it without passing him. He did, too. She could see anger roaring in his eyes, but also focus. He wasn't about to let his guard down. Good. Just stop. Her opponent spread his arms, waiting for her to rise, his body blurring as she struggled to her feet. This isn't going to get you anywhere. She struggled upright, only to tumble down to a knee as her legs buckled. Strength was everything to her. She accepted that, just as she knew there would always be those stronger than her. Ospin was such a being. The one and only time she'd challenged him, she'd been soundly defeated. Not like this. This lies hurt. She felt like death warmed over. She felt fear, and yet that fear was tempered by excitement. This wasn't like one of her brawls with Kuro or Tayin. Not even Summer could push her this far. She hadn't been beaten this badly been tested to this extent. Since she was a child. And yet he almost went to her when she fell, only narrowly managing catching himself at the last instant. Weakness. How she despised it. Just like the Shni. Are you done? He asked. Never. Her defiance angered him for some reason. She could see the spark of anger burn bright in his eyes again. Raven made a noise somewhere between a snarl and a shriek as she lurched at him anew. She lashed out with the ruined hilt of her sword, only to find her wrist caught in the unyielding grasp of a metal hand. That same arm wrenched her limb aside, twisting the muscles viciously. He hadn't even deigned to use a weapon, she realized. Somehow the thought burned even more. Was she not good enough to face his full strength she'd seen that glowing form of his, that speed against the Grim, this wasn't even a shadow of his earlier agility. She knew why. He was holding back. Stop playing with me. She spat in his face. Give me your all or giving me nothing at all. I'm not trying to kill you. His forehead jarred against hers, snarling just as hard. Just try, you bastard. Those azure orbs narrowed in what might have been recognition or more anger. She couldn't be sure. Those fingers of cold steel continued to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. They kept squeezing her wrist even as the omen's hilt tumbled from her grasp and clattered to the floor. Her arm wrenched too. The right with an ominous creak in her aura faltered her, bones beginning to fracture. She struck out with her free hand and he caught that one too, willingly grappling with her. Raven grit her teeth and refused to give him the satisfaction of crying out a second time. He wanted a contest of endurance she'd give him one. Thus it came as quite the surprise when he swept her legs, tore his right arm free from hers, and slammed a vicious heel palm into her chin. Raven was fast, very fast. She was a huntress of sixteen years, in peak physical condition, and the moment she realized she was exposed and without a weapon that she was going to get hit she tried to dodge in the air even as she tumbled to the mat. It just wasn't enough. She failed to account for three things. First, the sheer force behind said punch. Second, her faltering aura levels. And third, Naruto. Sense reasserted itself at the last second and the blonde wrenched his wrist aside, trying to turn what could have been a powerful uppercut into a rousing roundhouse instead. Unfortunately, in doing so Raven accidentally swayed right into his fist and her depleted aura failed to tank the hit. His fist barreled up into her chin and snapped her head into the mat. Raven's world went black as sweet slumber took her. Three hits. That was all it took to fell her. Through their entire exchange, she hadn't touched him. Not once. It was galling. Humiliating. Amazing. An awful pang of silence fell over all those assembled as her body slumped bonelessly to the floor. Few saw the small, sleepy smile that wreathed her visage. She'd found someone to test herself again, someone capable of pushing her. She wasn't the only one to realize it. He'd gotten lucky this time. Or so she told herself. She'd make him fight her again and again and again until she figured out just what it was that made him strong. He was a goal. Something, someone, to surpass. She passed out with that thought. Poor Birdie had no idea what she was getting into. Well, Ospie blinked. That happened. Summer didn't cackle. But she did giggle. Saw that coming. Come on, Raven. Ty sighed, stooping to retrieve her. Let's get you up. Shit. Hero groaned, but there was a smile tugging at his lips. She's gonna be pissed when she wakes up. Is she Summer tilted her head. You don't understand women very well do you, stilts poor Kuro. 
he really didn't. Naruto felt the slightest twinge of guilt as the rest of Team STRQ gathered around their stunned comrade. Out of the corner of his eye, Nicholas flicked him a thumbs up and pointedly moved to intercept Ospin before the man could try and corner him again. Naruto nervously returned it as he felt Willow all but glide up to him and wrap an arm in his. Moments later she laid her head to rest on his left shoulder. They stood like that for a few moments, leaning against one another in companionable silence. Thank you, she hummed at last. If you hadn't done that, I would've. Huh, Willow could have beaten Raven by herself he'd have to spar with her again sometime soon. No ulterior motives there. Nope, certainly not. He caught the faintest smile from the corner of his eye and realized she was pleased with what he'd done, so much so that she'd let her mask slip for a moment. He liked seeing her smile. Without thinking he tilted his head against her. The schnee stiffened, but made no effort to push him away. It felt this, after all that tension. She gonna be alright Kiro called to them. You really knocked her around back there. She'll be fine. Naruto rubbed his knuckles. I held back. It was nice meeting you. All of you. But I think it's time we were on our way. Wait wait wait. Summer blitzed him before he escaped. You would have a scroll, right? Yes Naruto's head nearly tilted horizontal in its confusion. Willow palmed her face. Summer, no. Bad girl. Just pull it out already. Against his better judgment, Naruto did as he'd been bait, Willow watching him all the while. The moment his hand cleared the pocket Summer ripped the device from his hand and hurriedly input something into it, her thumbs flying at a rapid pace across the screen. Several somethings, by the look of it. In a matter of moments, she shoved it back into his hand and bounced back half two paces. There. Now you have our numbers. She beamed. All of ours. Willow frowned. Summer. It's not like that. The smaller girl wailed, clenching her fists. It's just beat Raven. The pair exchanged a glance. And, okay, I messed that up. Summer blew a stray strand of dark hair from her face. Let me start over. Steadying herself, she startled them both with a bow. I know this is going to sound weird but thank you, Naruto. When she raised her gaze her reply startled them as much as the stoic expression behind it. Where had that spastic ditz of a girl gone for what you did? Raven needed someone to knock her off that high horse of hers. Maybe she'll get better once she wakes up. But if she gets out of hand like that again, you want me to knock her down a few pegs? He frowned. Please Summer blinked suddenly teary eyes at him. Did it mean the world to Team STRQ? Good lord you could weaponize that level of cuteness. Naruto folded before it like a house of cards. All right, all right, I give. He flailed an arm up to hide his face. Just stop looking at me like that. It burns. Summer chirruped happily. I appreciate it. Make sure Willow keeps in touch, all right don't let her be a stranger. Naruto squinted at her and found it himself forced to reconsider his initial opinion. Perhaps she wasn't quite the terror he'd first thought her to be. Happy, energetic, and obsessed with weapons to be sure, but she seemed to genuinely care for the well-being of her teammates. He recognized that much. But there was still one thing he didn't understand. How Willow Shnee could have befriended someone like Summer Rose. There had to be a story there. Maybe he should ask. Sure it was an interesting one. Willow squawked as saw his expression knew what he was about to ask. And she swiftly tugged him away. Leaving. Now, Naruto rolled his eyes, but allowed her to tug him away all the same. Like it or not, she'd grown on him. More so than that bloody woman. Raven. He was already trying to forget the name. If he had things his way, he'd never see that wild woman again. Hopefully he'd knock some sense into her. The bull had delivered Naruto and Willow to the world below with all due speed among other things. Land. Naruto cried as he flung himself from the craft, all but kissing the ground in his haste to escape. Never again. He croaked. I'm never flying again. There, there. Perhaps that was why Naruto looked so miserably when they first set foot in Mantle. Willow watched him like a hawk and massaged the small of his back as they disembarked the final few steps, ready to bolt the moment his neck bulged. She rather enjoyed him and his company, but she wasn't going to stand idly by if he blew chunks. She'd never live it down. Not when she'd gone to the trouble of dragging him away from summer. Still, it paid to be cautious. She didn't want him to dump his lunch on her skirt. A wise decision, for his face turned green not a moment later. He's never flown before. The realization startled Willow as she watched her supposed fiancé bolt to the nearest waste bin he could find. Of course he hasn't, she reprimanded herself. He wasn't from this world. Something told her they didn't have what Naruto called giant metal birds in his time. Hira, what have you? Bah. Thankfully when Naruto returned, his face had regained some semblance of color once more. Feeling better she ventured primly as she offered him her arm. Blurg. The blonde groaned. Kill me. If Naruto felt any shame for his earlier display or his actions up above, he did little to show it. Instead he allowed her to lead him on, heedless of the looks they received. Of course people would stare. It wasn't every day a member of Atlas came down to Mantle, much less a Schnee in Harris Court. Charade or not, she wasn't quite comfortable with calling him her fiancé. Not yet. Word had begun to spread in the absence of Jack, and soon many might yet see the truth for themselves. But in the interim the game continued. It. I'm glad we got out of there. Naruto said the word suddenly, drawing her up short. Raven was acting just like him. Who? Sasuk. He grumbled. She sounded like an old friend of mine back when he wasn't a friend. Willow let him talk. Naruto had his secrets, secrets he wouldn't give up without a fight. 
Even now, days after he'd landed here, he was still something of an enigma to her. She knew a little about him, his favorite colors, a bit about his personality and favorite foods, that he had a strong sense of right and wrong but not his past. Not enough it to truly understand him, at any rate. So that's why you were so riled up, she feigned a sigh once he'd finished, and here I thought you were fighting for my honor. Of course I'd fight for you. He grumbled under his breath. Willow turned beet red. Him moving on, then. Mantle was as cold as it could have been given the season, but even the sparse heat afforded by Atlas up above wasn't enough to banish the overcast skies today, nor the nip in the air. She'd long since grown inured to it, but Naruto was another matter. Were it not for the thick blue coat he wore, he suspected his teeth would be chattering. They probably were even now. He was just too stubborn to let her see. Such a boy. He'd have to get used to it. The cold never bothered her anyway. A chew. A stray snowflake tickled Willow's nose to draw forth a dainty sneeze and a laugh from Naruto. Here, take my jacket. He offered. What no, I'm fine. Really it was just a sneeze, you don't have to. And by offer, that meant he took the damn thing off and wrapped it around her shoulders before she could protest. Her traitorous cheeks betrayed her again. No. Bad Willow. No feelings. This was a business relationship to the letter. Personal feelings had no place here. Down, girl. Better. Better. She curled the fabric around herself. He still looked good in schnee colors. A tiny, traitorous part of her mind sulked. On that, they agreed. White and blue suited him, more so without the coat. Oh, he'd tear himself out of the gaudy blue dress shirt she'd stuffed him in and find something else the first chance he got. But he was a fine sight for sore eyes at the moment. No matter how much he might abhor it, the blonde cleaned up rather nicely when pressed to it. More so with his hair gone nearly white now. Most might think him a schnee already if it weren't for his whiskered cheeks or his brighter blue eyes. And if he minded the way she held onto his arm the entire way, he didn't protest at that. Willow took some quiet comfort in his warmth he provided as they made their way off the landing pad and into the city proper. Mantle rose all around them like a labyrinthine maze to meet them, arms stretched wide as if the city were greeting an old friend. She couldn't say she was happy to see it again. This far from Atlas the disparity was almost painful to behold. Ramshackle buildings and dilapidated shacks all but thrown together to form crude hotels, some even leaning against one another where the foundations had begun to crumble. Poor craftsmanship all around. Dark shapes shuffled in the alleyways just out of sight. Beggars waited on nearly every corner. She hadn't been down here in years. Indeed, she wouldn't have come at all were it not for Naruto's request. This was important. This was necessary. She needed to remind herself just how fortunate she was, lest she lose herself in her own ego. Lest she become someone like Raven. Nobody wanted to be like Raven. Hey, is that a shnee her ears pricked up as someone murmured nearby. What's she doing down here she could feel someone's eyes boring into her shoulders. Come to mingle with the common folk as she a man snarked and spat a ways behind her. Stuck up bitch. Naruto growled low and deep in his throat as they moved. Why are they doing this you haven't done anything to these people have you? No. Willow fixed her gaze on the street and hastened her pace. It's complicated. Just keep walking. You're the one who wanted to come down here, remember. I didn't know it was like this. He hissed. They're following us. Let them be, she whispered. It's not their fault. Assholes. His muted sigh stirred her. It wasn't their fault she told herself as a passing faunus with dog ears glowered at the two of them. Nor that a man with scales peeled off from a stall to shadow their footsteps. None of these people were wholly to blame for their plight, and she felt no fear of them with Sable at her hip nor Naruto by her side. Nor did she hold any distaste for the common folk. They were, each of them, just trying to make a living on meager means and her presence was drawing a crowd. This was a mistake, wasn't it? With it she had the lien, she would gladly give it all to them. Didn't they know that? Even so, she was no stranger to their looks, sneers, nor jeers. They knew she was a schnee, after all. She made no effort to hide it. Her face gave it away, if not her distinctive white hair and piercing blue eyes, then the crest emblazoned on the coat in which she was now wrapped. She understood their anger, but she couldn't bring herself to accept it either. Why the SDC had done no wrong to these people. Father's policies were fair, and pushed for equality in pay and housing. He gave jobs to those who wished to work, and didn't skimp on any safety measures that she knew of. She knew this. She'd seen it. Yes, the mines were dangerous, but they were trying to make them better. So why? Hey, someone was brave enough to hurl a rock at her. Naruto saw it coming and nimbly plucked it out of the air before it could dash itself against her aura. A quick twist of his wrist sent it skittering back the way it came with an angry crack. Someone yelped. Anyone else want to try that? His voice boomed like a thunderclap as he rounded on the gathering crowd. Many of them shrank back when they of his eyes. Of course they did. They weren't blue anymore but a savage shade of slitted scarlet. He likely sensed the one responsible and thought to chase them down. She could see that a part of him clearly wanted to, just as she could feel his human hand twist in hers. No doubt he craved a quick and abrupt end to what he viewed as injustice. Attacking them wouldn't be justice. It would be slaughter. Surely he wouldn't. His artificial arm snapped up and barked a dust round into the clouds, silencing them all. Look at you. The words struck like a whip as his gaze seared into them. This woman has done nothing to you. Nothing. What's your problem? She's a schnee. One cried. And Naruto looked left. Naruto looked right. Naruto scowled. As she heard any of you directly know is she directly responsible for your misfortune I didn't think so. 
If you want to throw stones, by all means go right ahead. He spread his arms and stepped before her, placing himself in the line of fire. Throw them at me, but I'm warning you. A lone finger rose to point at someone in the crowd, likely the perpetrator themselves. I'll throw them right back. No more stones were thrown. His lip curled in disgust. That's what I thought. A flash of gold was Willow's only warning before he ripped a pouch free from his belt. Do you see this Naruto held the bundle of Lian Hai, one of many Nicholas had given him, for all to see. There's more like this in it for you if you hear me out. Funny how easily Jangle of Coin could quiet a mob where words could not. Take your problems to Atlas. He said, I'll try my best to help anyone who needs it. If any of you actually want to fight Tade well. Naruto didn't use his hands to make a seal. He simply grit his teeth and pulsed. With a hollow intake of air and smoke, more than two dozen doppelgangers flooded the streets. Each spread their arms, forming a barricade between them and the masses. Naruto lazily slung the pouch of Lian over their heads and all thoughts of anger and justice were all but forgotten in the chaos that followed. By then, it was all too easy to make their escape. Why reveal yourself like that? Willow hissed. You'll draw attention to yourself. What were you thinking? I wasn't. Naruto admitted readily. What had got their attention off you? Mortified, she continued to tug him away with a wince. It wasn't enough. It never was. All the money in the world couldn't change the minds of the people. Some would never let go of their prejudices. Others delighted in stirring others up for their own means. If they wished to throw stones at her, so be it. But not the SDC, not Naruto. She would make things better, she swore. Or die trying. Banishing such grim thoughts from her mind, she pulled Naruto toward a nearby stand. Two meat buns, please. The owner of said stand, a faunus woman with gray hair and pox skin, looked upon her as one would a rotten carcass. She turned up her nose up and crossed both arms before her green apron. Don't want to serve a schnee, she said. Willow's temper bristled, but she stomped it down. I see. Then we'll take our business elsewhere. Thunk. Naruto stepped forward and slammed his fist on the counter with an audible thud. Willow noticed the crack he'd left behind in the wood and chose not to speak of it. How about me? Then his smile had entirely too many teeth. I'm a paying customer. Will you serve me? Surely the woman must have seen the spark in his eye, for she immediately deferred to him. Maybe it was his whiskers and she mistook him for a faunus. Aye, you're an odd one, but you're no schnee. What'll it be? Two meat buns. Naruto pointedly repeated her order. She wrinkled her nose. That the coin. Naruto slapped down another heavy pouch of Lian in response, one of the very same Willow had given him only days before. Sure enough, the woman stiffened and her eyes bulged, a spark of avarice burning bright behind those brown orbs. She reached a wrinkled finger forward and pocked it, as though expecting it to vanish at any moment. He pointedly pushed it at her. Keep the change. She had their meal ready in a matter of moments and looked all the more shamefaced for it. What's wrong with these people he asked when they were some distance away. What do they have against you? I'll tell you later. Willow wilted. Willow bit back a sigh as she peeled back the wrapper on her own bun. Naruto didn't understand. Of course he didn't. She'd not told him. He knew next to nothing of the faunus and their plight, nor the discrimination they faced. Discrimination some were beginning to return. She'd have to tell him soon. But for no is it so wrong to savor the moment just a little. Careful, he warned. It's hot. I noticed. Willow shot him a sidelong glance as she puffed on the bun, her breath turning to steam in the brisk air. I'm not a child, Naruto. She realized her mistake the moment the words left her mouth, but it was too late to take them back. You called your old man daddy. Lurk. Blast him. He had her there. She flailed frantically for an excuse. Why don't you call your parents the same? Dunno. Guileless blue orbs blinked back at her. They've been dead for a while now. His words elicited a flinch. I'm sorry. That was uncouth of me. Hey, it's fine. He paused to tear a bite through his bun. They died right after I was born. A boyish grin plucked at his whiskered cheeks as he swallowed. But I got to see them again, so it's all good. I think mom would have liked you. Eh, he scratched a whiskered cheek with one finger. Dad probably would have been over the moon. E.H. Willow squeaked. Was he saying his parents would have approved of her? What do you mean you met them again? That's impossible, Naruto. The dead can't come back to life. I'll tell you about it someday. Naruto promised, an odd twinkle in his eye. Woody Willow recalled Ospin's offer with a dreadful wince. Or you could tell me now. She crossed both arms before her bosom. Likes, you're scary. Naruto's grin rather reminded her of a small child. Sure, why not well, I guess you could say. Something slammed into him from behind, eliciting an annoyed grunt from the whiskered warrior. Willow followed his gaze and her heart stopped. There was a knife in his leg. Naruto, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Much to her surprise the blonde merely rolled his eyes and reached around to pull it free. He'd been looking up when he should have looked down. Unfortunately in doing so, the half-eaten meat bun slipped from his grasp. Someone leaped to grab it with a desperate cry, landed in an awkward tumble, then sprinted away. I've got them. Willow drew Sable and flicked a glyph after the fleeing urchin to slow them before they could dart around a corner and escape. Naruto pounced like a panther even as her semblance faded. They never stood a chance. He caught their assailant in mid-leap with a flying tackle and bore them to the ground with his artificial arm. With the other he reached for his stolen meal. Oh, he recoiled with a hiss. She bit me. She. I didn't do anything. A thin, reedy voice wailed beneath the blonde. Let me go. You stabbed me. Naruto climbed to his feet, dragging his would-be killer up after him. 
poorly at that, but the fact still stands. I just wanted your food, fool. They snapped back. Hand it over. I don't think you're in any position to make demands. It was with a certain level of incredulity that Willow watched the two of them. Well, less watching in Naruto's case, more pulling. He frowned at the slip of the girl who the audacity to shank him. She hadn't done a very good job. Even now she flailed in his grasp like a little hellcat, trying to claw his eyes out. She was dirty, filthy, wrapped in rags, her dark hair a ratty mess. And she'd still tried to mug him over a bit of food. He wasn't sure if he should be impressed or furious. Gotch was just a kid. She couldn't be more than eight, nine at the most. And she'd stabbed him. His mind was having troubling reconciling that one. Bah, he let her do it. Hirama sniped. You're a softy like that. He had sensed something but he hadn't thought anyone would be foolish enough to attack him, so he'd let it happen. Clicking his tongue, he plucked the knife out of his thigh. A glass dagger, crude and fragile. It crumbled away in his hand even as he held it. His wound wasn't a deep one by any means, more of an awkward gouge, the weapon itself little more than a sliver of unusual make. Was this what Willow called a semblance frowning? He returned his attention to the little waif before him and plucked her up by the scruff of her neck. She tried to bite him. Points for spirit if nothing else. He liked to think he hadn't fallen so far as hurt children yet. Still, he gave her a light shake when she tried to nip him again. Spunk was all well and good, but he wasn't fixing to be someone's chew toy. What's your name, runt? Amber eyes blazed back at him, wild and feral. Why should I tell you? Willow bun please. She provided him hers and he held up the meat bun to the urchin. There's food in it for you. A name's all I need. Amber eyes lit up as life returned to them. There could be no missing the telltale shiver that shot down her spine as he waved the morsel before her face. She took her lower lip between her teeth and seemed to weigh his words for a moment. Poor thing. She looked so small. So cold. Maybe he should give her his jacket, even if it was too large for her. Damn it. He didn't know what to do. Willow looked just as conflicted, though for different reasons he didn't understand. There was no help to be had there when he met her gaze. In the end, however, the girl gave him her name. Cinder. Naruto rolled the name on his tongue, considering it for a long moment. Cinder. Why did that name sound so familiar had he heard it somewhere before now? Probably wasn't anyone important. What harm was there in giving her a bit of food he could always buy more? This girl looked like she hadn't eaten in a week, maybe more. Here you go. He set her down and tossed her the bun. You've earned it. She snatched it from his grasp and downed it in three bites. Amber eyes rose expectantly to meet his again. Naruto shrugged helplessly, breath steaming in the frigid air. Sorry, that was all I had. I'm still hungry. It was a whine. Willow groaned behind him. You cannot be serious. Amber eyes snapped to her. Wasn't talking to you. Go away. Naruto nearly staggered backward even as Willow made angry Willow noises. Irk. He'd just taken critical damage. This one was worse than Summer. Much worse. If she had learned to weaponize cuteness, then this one had turned surly defiance and pouting into a walking nuke. Besides, she was so small, so tiny. How could you ignore someone like this? That would akin to kicking a kitten. No one kicked a kitten. Worse, he could tell she wasn't faking any of what she'd just said. Children were easy to read, this one more than most. There was no deceit here, no deception, no grand plan to make him lower his guard so she could slip in and slice his throat in the dead of night. All he felt from her washinger, not just for food, but for life itself. She had a spiteful ambition not only to survive, but to live. It was that same ambition that led her to try and knife him over a bit of food, even if she'd failed. What do you want me to do? Steal some, he laughed. Yes, you're strong. She said it without a glimmer of hesitation. Steal some more. See, it sounded so different when she said it. Raven made it sound wrong somehow. When this girl said it, her words seemed more of a statement. She knew he could, but that didn't mean he would. He wasn't going to go back and box that faunus lady around the ears just to make a point. But he wasn't about to leave a child out here in the cold, either. Again, why he challenged. She squirmed in place. Because I'm still hungry. Where are your parents? Surely she had some. She had to. He didn't want to consider the alternative. Don't got none. She growled at him at him in her rough accent. Her eyes widened suddenly, concerned. You gonna kill me? No, never. She had fire. So much fire. Could he really turn his back on her here Atlas was cold, mantle even more so. She'd freeze to death. It was a miracle she hadn't done so already. Something twitched in his heart. An orphan, out here in the freezing cold. Stabbing people and stealing scraps to survive. That was rather ghastly now that he thought about it. Still, he knew what it was to have no one. He'd been there before, and while he hadn't been forced to steal scraps from the streets in his apartment, there had been a time, long ago, where he'd come close. Very close. He didn't have any more money on him now. But he had something else. Don't you do it. He made a snap decision, and Kurama swore at it. I'm a do it. Quick as a flash Naruto reached down and swept little Cinder from her feet. She was light, almost frightfully so. It only further reinforced his belief that this was the right thing to do. Of course she flailed wildly in his arms, scratching and clawing at him, no doubt thinking that he meant to do her harm. Her struggle ceased as he swung her up onto his shoulders. Her hands flailed again, but this time for purchase. Thin arms looped around his neck and held on for dear life as he tactfully supported her by her little legs. Right, that does it. You're adopted. Cinder absolutely squeaked. Wait, what? Willow made a choking sound. I beg your pardon. As she looked on the blonde grunted and tucked little Cinder closer to his back. 
For some reason, the urchin didn't resist, it wasn't that she couldn't. She was simply unable to. She looked just as stunned as Willow felt, her golden eyes wide, mouth slack even as she clung onto his shoulders. Poor girl. He'd broken her with those words. Wait, were those tears in her eyes? Did I stutter a blue eye peeked over his shoulder? I'm adopting her. You can't be serious. She tried to kill you. Yow yow you're not going to budge on this, are you? Naruto sauntered on ahead with a jaunty whistle that sounded entirely too cheery for her liking. New hope. Hey, hen, best get to voting, hey surprise. Little, Cinder is adorable, ain't she stubborn, too. Papa, Naruto is best Naruto. Weren't expecting him this early, were ya? Some may think this version of Cinder is a pawn of Salem. I'll say it now, she ain't. Thought I was out of tricks, did you? Thought this chapter would follow convention, did you? Wrong you would be. Weren't expecting that, were you? It was surprisingly easy to write, given we know Jack all of Cinder's past and where she's from. We only know that she came from nothing and was likely an orphan like Emerald. And until we get her backstory well, Rooster Teeth isn't going to be revealing that anytime soon. If they do, I'll change things. But for now, to be fair, Cinder is very young in this story. I believe it matches the timeline, given that we know her to be several years younger than Raven at least. They didn't even list her exact age anywhere I could find it, but given what we've seen it seems Cinder is younger than Raven and Kuro at the very least in canon by a good margin. Since we know absolutely jack all about Summer and the past missions of Team STRQ, I've had to create events for them. Don't even get me started about Nicholas Schnee. We have even less info on him, but I didn't expect to strike gold with his personality. Folks have been comparing him to Reinhardt from Overwatch. Sure, I can get behind that, though it wasn't my intent. We'll be delving far more deeply into things this chapter, so I do hope you're prepared. In hindsight, it makes sense that Ozpin and Nicholas would get along swimmingly, perhaps if Oz was just a touch less paranoid in canon, that might have happened. Who knows Nicholas and Willow are very much blank slates, so I'm working with what we have here. I've said enough about Summer already. That's right, folks. Team STRQ and Ozpin are here. To say any more would spoil things, so I'll let the chapter do the talking for me. We get to see quite a few characters this time around, fitting given just how long this chapter is. Now we get to leap into eh, uh, all the juicy bits. Hope you enjoyed that. As for pairing Snope, not telling yet. In fact, I've even created a poll on my profile. Give it a look and a vote after your review, will you? Or you could just vote via review. Most folks do, these days. Reviews are all that keep this sick man going these days, they truly brighten my day. So in the immortal words of Atlas, review, would you kindly, and enjoy the previews. Which reminds me, spoilers, 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 read at your own risk. Or a base storage scrolls. Watts practically foamed at the mouth. Hey you that's brilliant. This'll change the world. Little Cinder tore into the food before her as though it were her last meal. Naruto blew out a breath and watched from his perch. Adopting a kid. What the hell had he been thinking he didn't know the first thing about raising a kid? Did he regret it not at all? More. Willow arched an eyebrow. May have I more, please? Cinder squirmed in her seat, then considered again. Mommy. Willow felt her face turn incandescent as Naruto tumbled out of the window with a startled squawk. Critical damage. He didn't trust himself, so he swarmed them with clones. Thus the brawl, mugging, or whatever the devil it was, ended in moments. Caught unprepared by the sudden onslaught, the man's attackers were quickly overwhelmed. One turned to flee and one clone launched another at him like a missile, tackling him to the floor. Naruto blinked, surprised at the ingenuity. He tried to better himself since he came to this world, and it seemed his clones had taken that lesson to heart. In the end, it's about trust. He said, I didn't get your name. James. His ally extended an arm. James Ironwood. Thanks for the assist. Don't mention it. Naruto shook without thinking. More fool he. The man had a grip just like his name. That trick you did with the clones, the general frowned, just how many can you make? Alas, Naruto didn't even pause to consider his answer. I dunno. Hundreds thousands never really tested my limits. James choked, his mind already worrying at the implications. If what he said was truth I's individual was a one-man army. Atlas needed this. I demand a rematch. No. How many times do I have to tell you to go away? They shouldn't do that. Naruto shook his head. People are people. Faunus have rights, too. Nicholas beamed at the boy. Well said. Now what are you going to do about it? His protege blinked, frowned, smirked. I have an idea. He made a fool of me, made me the laughing stock of Atlas. I'll do anything, Jack gasped, reaching out hand toward the shadowy figure as he knelt. Anything. Hand over the girl, and you won't be harmed. Nope. Naruto scoffed. Nope, nope, nope. Not doing that. Lots of nope. Summer poked her head over her ally's shoulder and blew a raspberry. Nye. As she looked on the blonde bared his teeth in a smile that had entirely too many teeth for her liking. For a moment, an instant, a heartbeat, his body seemed to flicker with golden light. There was a high, wild light to his eyes, turning them scarlet in the dim light. He took on a low stance and whipped his human arm outward. A knife slapped home from the sheath hidden in his wrist and landed in a waiting palm. He held it for a brief moment, then flicked it, almost lazily at their attacker. Unfortunate. The hooded man caught it and spoke in a voice like gravel. No one had to die here today. You're right, Naruto sighed, raising one hand in a seal. They didn't. Nor will they. The Kane's hidden explosive tag went off with a roar in the man's palm. 
In the chaos, Naruto grabbed Summer and bolted. I didn't expect grandchildren this soon. Daddy, do not. Don't you dare. But she's so cute. Rags to riches. Mantle was a harsh mistress. Cinder knew this to be true, because this lesson this tear. Hibble, awful truth had been burned into her back time and time again. Living in the shadow of Atlas only further served to cement this belief. If you weren't tough enough to brave the cold you died. If you couldn't survive the streets or the gangs that ran them you died. If you couldn't rely on yourself you died. If you trusted anyone you died. If you let your guard down three guesses, and the first two don't count. That's right you died. Cinder was many things. Fierce. Feisty. Fiery. Other big words that started with the letter F but she wasn't foolish. Idiots didn't live long in Mantle. And yet in that very same vein, she'd made the worst mistake of her life today. She'd been desperate, hadn't eaten in days. Nearly a week. Her food had been stolen by someone, and she'd been beaten when she tried to procure more. She didn't run with the gangs, no one wanted to use children for anything other than drugs in the winter season and she would have no part of that. Never that. But she'd been hungry. So, so hungry. Desperation drove her to make mistakes. She'd glimpsed a single pair of people storming away from a nearby stand. Seen the food in their hands, warm, hot food for her cold and empty belly. Food. Little legs had propelled her forward almost before she realized what she was doing. A week ago she would have shadowed them for a block or two, wary of a trap. This time hunger overcame her and she surged after them. Not to murder she wouldn't dare but to snatch the prized morsels from their grasp. She still remembered the heat of her semblance flaring in her grimy hand, superheating the glass dagger clutched within. But you see, that was where little Cinder had made a mistake. Blinded as she was by that desperation, her world shrouded in a haze of hunger, she hadn't seen the schnee until it was too late. Even as she recognized the signature stark white hair and snow-pale complexion, her knife was already falling towards her thigh. It wasn't fair what was a schnee doing down here they hardly ever left Atlas by then she was too close to abort her attack. She could only change its path. Ironically, this saved Cinder's life. Somehow she'd managed to twist her arm and slash the man beside the schnee instead. Attacking a bodyguard would net her a beating to be sure if he caught her but stabbing a schnee that was death. There was an unspoken rule in Atlas and Mantle alike. You didn't mess with a schnee, or even a schnee's guard for that matter. But the hunger left her choice. Food. Hers. Now. So she shanked the blonde bastard in the leg as hard as she could, which wasn't much, given how weak hunger had made her. When the whiskered man and she'd get to that nickname later reached down to pluck her dagger, he dropped his food. Just as planned. Little Cinder did what any thief would do. She caught it and bolted, devouring the meat bun even as she ran for her life. She didn't care for their cries at their back, she was small, fast, and clever. They'd never catch her. No one had before. Then they caught her. That stupid schnee did something with a glyph that slowed her, giving her bodyguard the chance to tackle her. He tried to take her food. Hers the gall she'd stolen it fair and square and she bit him when he tried. He laughed and didn't try again. He didn't hit her, didn't snarl at her, didn't do anything at all. He just left. Laughed and plucked her off the ground like some angry kitten. The schnee had shouted at her, but not this one. He'd asked her name, promised her still more food if she answered. So she gave it to him and he fed her. Naturally, she demanded more. He could never be satisfied in mantle, an urchin like her needed to fight for every scrap they possibly could. Cinder had learned this the hard way. Satisfaction meant complacency. Complacency meant death. This was her mark and she was determined to wring every scrap from him she could before the schnee wised up and dragged him away. She'd sworn that if this was her last day on Remnant and judging by the way the schnee glared at her at the time it might well have been she was determined to meet it with a life well lived. Cinder succeeded in that aim, succeeded beyond her wildest dreams. The Schnee Manor was mighty and tall, just thinking of it made her feel tiny and small. Oh, how the guards had sneered when they first saw her, turning up their noses in derisive scorn. They'd offered to take her off the whiskered man's hands. Yeah, take her and throw her back down to mantle at least they had until the Schnee had told them just what she'd thought of that. She might defer to the whiskered man, but the Schnee had power of her own, too. Her word was law, just as much as his. Where they spoke, people moved. She'd have to remember that. She glimpsed others in the mansion briefly in passing, others who had balked at her presence, but she didn't care for them. Why should she? She'd barely had time to meet them before Willow ushered her away to give her a bath. Their names weren't important to Cinder, she'd already labeled each of them and lent them titles of her own. There was Silver Eyes, all bright and bubbly and happy. Red Eyes was dark and broody. There was the Crow with his sly smirks and easy laughter, followed by the smiling one who seemed to get along with everyone and everything. Then there was the man with the cane, less said about him the better. That one scared her, but what truly terrified her was. Splash. Hot water came crashing down on Cinder's little head like a waterfall, jerking the orphan out of her thoughts and back to reality with a startling lurch and yelp alike. Instinct compelled her to tighten her shoulders and duck low as the water came on again to wash the shampoo from her hair, even as she sought to make herself as small a target as humanly possible didn't do her any good. She could hunch over all she liked, but she couldn't hide in the tub, much from the prying fingers that followed to sternly massage her scalp with brisk efficiency. Cinder squinted her eyes against them as much as the bitter stinging suds that followed, wriggling helplessly. That sting she whined like the child she was. Stop it. Close your eyes, then. Willow sighed behind her and continued to scrub her down like the taskmaster she was. It's just a bath. 
You're not going to die. And two cinder reared back and hissed like an angry kitten. I don't have to listen to Yao Gek. Another wash of hot water rushed down, cutting her off with a sputter and sending her slipping in the bath once more. Dirt and grime sluiced down her feet. She barely noticed the brackish water before Willow yanked one of her arms up and attacked it with noting but a bar of soap and singular determination. Stupid Snee, giving her orders giving her a bath who did she think she was she had half a mind to. Cinder Naruto's muffled voice echoed through the bathroom door. What was that noise are you behaving in there? Willow arched a demure eyebrow. A fine question. Are you behaving, Cinder? Blast it, they had her. Try as she might, Cinder couldn't fight down the flinch that followed as those ice blue eyes bored into her. Though the blonde wasn't in the room with them, his voice carried the weight of authority, even if he didn't realize it. Defiance bled from her shoulders like a broken sieve and she soundlessly slumped in the tub, all thoughts of escape washing down the drain with the bad bathwater. She wanted to stab the schnee. Badly. So very, very badly. But if she did that, she wouldn't get any more food. Yes, Papa. The words came haltingly as her face flushed. I'll be good. Willow absolutely sputtered and a small squelching sound came from the other end of the door as someone banged their head against the wooden frame. Not Naruto, surely. Someone so strong wouldn't be flustered by a few words. And so Cinder hummed, content in her victory, pyrrhic though it was. She radiated smugness, even as the Schnee continued to scrub the dirt from her body. Because she'd been adopted, taken off the streets by these two and dropped into the very lap of luxury itself. Oh, the Schnee had protested at first, but the whiskered man had spoken and that was that. His word was law. He was the true power here. They whisked her away into this giant mansion and all thoughts of resistance or escape had been stymied by the horror of bathing that followed. Until this moment she'd done her best to try and appease them, make herself seem small, useful, in hopes that they wouldn't kill her. And to her surprise, they hadn't. At first she wondered at it. Why why do this out of the goodness of their hearts did people do that her parents hadn't? Just thinking about it threatened to shatter Cinder's beliefs, everything she'd ever known until this moment. People didn't help each other. Not without a good reason. They just didn't. It wasn't done. Nobody in Mantle or Atlas or anywhere. Didn't they there must be a motive, some way to understand their actions. She thought they were going to kill her at first, instead they'd given her a hot bath and fussed over her like the child she was. Why would they do such a thing there must be some way this benefited them. Wait that was it. In hindsight, it was Osubius or so Cinder thought. She thought herself clever, when in truth she outsmarted herself. They couldn't have children. Perhaps the Schnee was so desperate for a child that they'd stooped to taking one off the streets. That must have been why they were down there in the first place. Sure, they were young, but who was she to judge was that their angle it made sense. It must be. Of course, little Cinder had no way of knowing just how mistaken she was. She thought herself right clever for making such a deduction and didn't even accept the possibility that she might actually be wrong, that they'd simply taken her in for reasons she couldn't comprehend. She needed an answer a role to fulfill and accepted the first one that fit. They wanted a daughter, did they she could do that, for the whiskered man. But for this one, arms up, Willow commanded and Cinder dutifully complied, allowing herself to be toweled off. Hey you, she groused, gritting her teeth as the towel descended on her head with brisk dispatch. Hate you so much. Oh, a bemused gleam shone in the woman's visible eye. We could always bring you back to Mantle if you dislike this place so. Back to the dirt. Back to the fear. Back to the gangs, the grit, and the grim. Winter was coming, and she didn't have any food or shelter now. She wouldn't even survive to see spring. If they sent her back to Mantle she'd die in a ditch. Frozen. Cold. Alone. A very real spark of fear shot down Cinder's spine and she trembled. Her head whipped back and forth frantically. No. The words escaped her in a whisper. I like it here. Please don't send me back. To her credit, the Schnee realized she'd made a mistake and reacted quickly before tears could fall. There, there. She crooned softly, wrapping her in a towel before drawing her into a quick hug. Don't be upset. I didn't mean that. Her apology caused the girl to stiffen in her arms and Willow pulled back in response. But even as Cinder thought to capitalize on this the towel was all but whisked away and a large white shirt swooped down on her head, followed by a pair of pale blue breeches. We're not going to send you back to that awful place. Willow's promise remained, even as Cinder hurriedly tugged the clothes on and refused to look at her. You have my word on that. Her lip trembled traitorously. Promise. A hand descended, idly stroking her scalp in slow, circular movements. It felt this, so much so that Cinder's suspicions sparked right back to life again. What are you doing? Even I had a mother once, Willow's words caused Cinder to look up in surprise, a petulant golden eye peeking through her dark tresses as she fumbled with her new attire. Shocking, I know. Would you believe I even had an old sister, too the Schnee continued, all but holding her attention and thrall, they both died when I was very young, or so father told me. Cinder flinched, but Willow pretended not to notice. It was so long ago, I can't even remember what they looked outside of the odd photograph. Still her palm continued to trace its path on her head, massaging Cinder's still damp hair beneath. And while it's true I remember very little about them, Willow continued as she helped her change, I do recall they used to do this whenever I was stressed. She graced her with a small smile when Cinder sullenly tugged the shirt up and over her head and yanked on the breeches. It's one of the only memories I have of them, really. Those ice-blue eyes softened and she removed her hand. For what it's worth, I'm sorry for upsetting you. Cinder scowled at the schnee, considering what to say. 
in the end gave up stuck her tongue out. Fine, I forgive you, Lini. Willow arched another brow. What was the? Oh, that was such a sad story Naruto's voice bawled happily through the door, causing Willow and Cinder alike to jump. They'd all but forgotten that they had an audience. I didn't know about that why didn't you tell me about that before? Cinder was nothing if not perceptive. She saw the way the Shnee Willow, she reminded herself wilted under the weight of her words, her pale face now gone nearly scarlet before she managed to master herself. And so her suspicions were confirmed. Whatever their union was, it wasn't a loveless one. With a look that promised death if the orphan so much as breathed a word of this, the Shnee heiress craned her neck towards the door and glowered pale blue daggers at it. Did you have anything else to add, dear by the brothers she could feel the frost in those words. By all means, keep digging that hole. Nah, came the muffled sigh. Just wanted to tell you the girls are back. You're about to have company. Willow pursed her lips. Could you keep them occupied? A weighted pause followed those words. Have you seen Summer? Fair enough. Now that she'd gotten over that initial shock, Cinder found she could assess her situation properly. Even an urchin like her understood the pecking order. She knew full well that she was at the bottom of it. Then came the guards, followed by Team STRQ, the Schnee, and at the top, the Whiskered Man. Everything and everyone else was of secondary interest at best. For one such as her, nothing else mattered in her new life. Not Ospin. Not Team STRQ. Fist there was the no-not-so-hated Schnee, whom she reluctantly acknowledged as Willow. Cinder hadn't thought of a good name for her beyond that yet. But she would. She was good with names. She would call her the Schnee for now. She was easily agitated, easier to read than the Whiskered Man. He didn't frighten her, if anything he confused her. For now, Naruto couldn't be anything but the Whiskered Man to Cinder, thus named such for the three marks on either cheek and the way his eyes seemed to squint whenever he laughed. It reminded her of a fox. What was a human faunus she couldn't be sure. He moved like a hunter, though. Hunters were dangerous. Even the gangs feared them. A single hunter could and often would be sent down from Atlas to purge them whenever they got uppity. Yet another reason Cinder didn't run with gangs. Yet, for all his well-meaning smiles and easy laughter, the whiskered man was an enigma to her, one she didn't wholly understand. And what you didn't know could kill you. I brought more towels. Speaking of death, while the interior of the Schnee mansion had proven itself to be both large and sprawling, a single bathroom could have housed five or more people. As things stood judging by the commotion outside the door Cinder suspected that this room soon would. For while the guards outside clearly disliked her, those within were another matter. Summer chose that moment to make grand entrance. All at once the door to the washroom flew open and Naruto tumbled inside as the spry little huntress nearly bowled him over to get inside. Cinder wasn't fooled for a moment. He'd let her do that. She saw the small frown on his lips, the way in which he twisted himself aside to divert her clumsy charge into a tumble. Much to her surprise the white-cloaked warrior bounced off literally bounced a nearby wall, followed soon thereafter by the ceiling and somehow managed to stick the landing. Cinder recoiled in horror as Naruto and Willow clapped politely. Gods, the girl wasn't human. Nailed it said Huntress declared proudly, striking a pose. Hey, nine out of ten. Naruto offered. Cinder considered it a six. I'll take it now where so then those silver eyes fell upon her and blinked in surprise. An armful of white towels tumbled from Summer's grasp. You're already dressed, Hyaland. Cinder shrank back. Naruto saw what was coming. Yuho, silver eyes all but sparkled with wild glee. Cinder backpedaled. She wasn't gonna do that. Surely not. Summer, no. Willow growled a warning. Down bad Summer. Summer's already cheeky grin grew to epic proportions. She was gonna. Naruto and Willow tactlessly threw themselves out of the way as she surged forward. Unfortunately in doing so, they tossed Cinder under the bus. She froze like a deer in headlights, eyes wide. One does not simply escape Summer Rose and her hugs, now it was her turn to learn that terrible lesson. Poor girl. She never stood a chance, indeed, she made it all of one step backward before Summer descended upon her like a storm. Slim arms swept Cinder from her feet and crushed the girl's face against her chest with incredible strength. She's Kokuyut. Cinder wriggled like a wild cat in the older girl's arms, to no avail. Silvery demon woman let me go. Silver eyes didn't scare Cinder, if anything she reminded Cinder of an eager puppy she'd once known before too many kicks from a bunch of boys turned it mean. Happy, eager to please, and far, far, far too affectionate for her liking a low growl fled from her lips as Summer cuddled her closer still. Could this evening possibly get any worse? Summer, let go. Naruto warned. You're gonna break her. Never she's mine now I'm keeping her arm. She hastily amended as a pair of ice blue eyes found hers. I mean, I can be her aunt, right? Cinder rapidly shook her head and mouthed the word no at Naruto and Willow no a thousand times no. Summer Naruto placed a hand on her shoulder. Yes she beamed. Drop her. Oh, uh, of course. Summer's entrance was the excuse for the rest of Team STRQ to bowl their way into the room. Once they realized everyone was decent, events snowballed from there. Somehow, Cinder managed to wriggle free in the chaos and duck behind Willow's skirt, but even that shelter didn't last long in the face of these new arrivals. The smiling Manti, she recalled took one look at her skittish expression and granted her a nod. Nothing more. Cinder quietly elevated her somewhat pale opinion of him. Not so the bird brain. So, this is the runt we saw earlier Kuro saw her and bent down to muss her hair, drawing a black look from the girl. Barely recognize you without all that dirto. 
Cinder reared back and bit his hand before he could think to muster his aura. Hard, true to form, Kiro recoiled with a strangled yelp, clutching at the throbbing red mark she'd left him. Willow actually laughed at that and patted her head. Cinder dared a smile at her, when her patron returned in kind as she pinched Summer's cheek, drawing a wine from the cloaked huntress. Huh, mate. Willow understood the pecking order, too. Maybe the schnee wasn't so bad after all. Alas, it didn't last. Naruto sensed the danger a heartbeat before anyone else, before even Cinder's own innate paranoia, likely because he heard the rapidly approaching footsteps surging down the hall toward them. Blue eyes narrowed and he blew out an irritated breath as he raised his false arm toward the Norwine door. Tai and Willow exchanged a long-suffering glance and the latter released Summer to step back. The reason for their overabundance of caution became vividly clear as someone burst into the room and tried to cut Naruto down where he stood. Not a single drop of blood was shed, because metal fingers neatly pinched Omen's crimson dust blade before it could descend on his head. Found you Raven Branwen howled her fury, bearing down on her weapon with all her might and a manic grin. I demand a rematch here and now. Really Naruto drawled as held the trembling sword at bay. This is getting old Haven your way. In a single seamless movement the blonde shattered her blade, twisted his wrist, and yanked her off balance. Raven squawked like a startled bird as she sailed over his shoulder back into the hall. Naruto waltzed after her with a lazy gait, which in turn caused Willow to hurry after him and Cinder took that as her cue to follow with the rest. She winced at the harsh clash of steel and when next she saw Raven Branwen or Red Eyes as she'd come to call her the angry woman with sprawled face first into the ground. Not a heartbeat later, she bounded upright again. Once more that one didn't count. Raven, really Naruto flung up his arms. Again already come on. Hundred Lian says he beats her arse again. Kiro rolled his eyes. Cinder immediately reversed her opinion of said Branwen. Summer slapped his hand. I say ten seconds. Can can I bet two? Kiro whipped around with a grin. Can we keep her? You cannot. Willow hummed, tucking her close. Naruto and I saw her first. Aw, oh, don't be like that, Ice Queen. The younger Branwen drawled. I'd make a great uncle. Hey Summer wailed. No fair if he gets to be an uncle then I wanna be an aunt tie back me up here. Hey, let's not and say we did. The blonde shrugged as Raven sailed past and crashed into a wall. Tai winced. Think we should stop them. Naruto and Raven snorted in unison, realized they'd done so, and promptly went back to attacking one another. Cinder, meanwhile, found herself caught between the remainder of Team STRQ and Willow. Not painfully, of course, she simply wasn't used to having so much attention. Down in Mantle, she'd always done her best to remain hidden. To suddenly have so many vying for her attention well. She simply didn't know what to do with it, because it frightened and excited her in equal measure. What am I, a chew toy or something? Red Eyes on the other hand annoyed Cinder, in part because she smelled like blood, but also her arrogance. Anyone who craved that much battle couldn't be right in the head. From what she'd been and what she'd just seen, Raven couldn't accept her defeat, no matter how soundly she was defeated. She just kept coming back for more. What was she an adrenaline junkie or something strength was all well and good when you were on the streets, but without a goal, what was the point even a child could see that this path would lead her nowhere good? Someone needed to knock some sense into Red Eyes soon. Oh, and she was down for the count again. Is she always like this cinder muttered aside? She seems foolish. No, actually. To her surprise, it was Taeyang who answered her, drawing a curious look from the urchin. She's not always like this, you know. He said, earning himself a confused look as Raven tumbled back to the floor without her sword. Raven and Kuro didn't have the best upbringing. Kuro's adjusted rather well since, but Ray both winced as she flew back at Naruto with a shriek, only to be ruthlessly dismantled once more. She's got a competitive streak a mile wide and hates to lose. She's not a bad person once you get to know her, she's just bad. Cinder stifled a smile at the declaration. Bad Raven Naruto rebuked her once more, jabbing a finger against the latter's nose when she tried to attack him once more. No bad she winced when he flicked her forehead, the action drawing a small giggle from Summer in the background. You can't beat me like this you're sloppy I can read your every move. He'd likely thrown those words at Raven just to shut her up, and under any other circumstance they might have worked. Unfortunately, Cinder saw a spark of defiance burn high in the Huntress's gaze. It was an expression she knew all too well from the slums. Desperation. Raven couldn't lose to him, no, she could and had, but she simply couldn't bear the idea of being bested so easily by someone her age. Cinder waited and saw the exact moment that desperation crystallized into furious resolve. As such, she had a front row seat to the spectacle that followed. Then train me. Birdie say what now Naruto squawked. Willow went positively ashen. I'm sorry, what no? Absolutely not. You're leaving tomorrow, remember. I can make time before then. Raven challenged. What's wrong? Shni afraid I'll steal him don't worry. He's not much to look at. Willow absolutely hissed at the slight, her pale face flaring a sharp shade of scarlet. Are you trying to calm me down you're doing a poor job of it? You're not exactly easy on the eyes yourself, Birdbrain. Naruto snarked back, earning him a glower of his own. Too angry and edgy by half. It's kinda off-putting, you know. Raven absolutely hissed. You little. Team STRQ reacted in myriad of different ways. Kuro hooted with a loud call that wearing perhaps the biggest shite-aiding grin Cinder had ever seen in her little life. Summer spun and gave him a high five. Tai slapped a palm to his forehead and started muttering beneath his breath. Cinder just blinked. 
Well, she'd expected many things but not that that, never that, him train her she didn't like it, let alone the idea of anyone monopolizing his time. She wasn't sure why, but it rankled her all the same. Me too, she whispered, no one heard, none save Naruto. I want to learn, too. Oh gods, she'd done it now. Sensitive ears pricked up and his head snapped to her with such force that he nearly suffered whiplash. She expected anger, annoyance at least. All she found was surprise. Hey, I mean sure, to her great delight, Naruto scratched a whiskered cheek and yielded to her pleading gaze. I don't see why not, guess I could teach you a few things, if you think it'll help. And Willow, if she wants, he amended hurriedly as her hand clamped down his arm and twin chips of ice all bored into neck. But not Raven. Why not? He scowled at her. Don't wanna. Oh, so you'll teach the schnee and a child, but not me she jerked to her feet and rammed her forehead against his. Coward, how can you be such a hypocrite? I don't use a bloody sword the blonde butted right back, blue eyes blazing into red. I have nothing to teach you you'll do fine on your own. You're still going to train me. Raven's mouth twisted into a defiant smirk. If not no, then later. Your head back to Vale tomorrow. Willow stepped to his side, tugging Cinder with her. We are. Raven smiled in way for a moment. That won't be a problem. You absolute dolt. Oh, Summer caught the hint and pounced on with a sharp gasp. Raven's semblance. Naruto grimaced. The hell's a semblance. All eyes Cinder included turned to her with a baffled look as Raven preened. The remainder of Team STRQ recovered first. Hiro's eyes lit up, with Tai not a heartbeat behind. All this talk of semblances sailed right over Cinder's little head, but by the end of it, Naruto had gone nearly apoplectic with anger and Willow with him. Cinder didn't much understand a lot of it. Summer had gushed about bonding and portals. Still, she understood this much, Raven could create a portal to whomever she'd bonded to. Apparently being a rival or someone to defeat counted enough in Raven's eyes. She even demonstrated as much. That that was a handy ability. It made her heat and flames look paltry by comparison. For a moment afterward, just a moment, Cinder thought Naruto might explode. Naruto's face absolutely twitched. You know what, screw it. Garden. Tomorrow. All three of you. He swore and spun away. I've had enough for tonight. Can we get something to eat or what? Cinder almost began to wonder if the whiskered man was cursed somehow. He had to know what he was doing, didn't he? Now, now, a gentle voice soothed as a burly man bearing a white beard and heavy armor bowled into the hall from an adjacent corridor, ice blue eyes shining. I believe the boy's quite right. That's enough chaos for one night. I'll thank you not to blow holes in my home. Finally, a voice of sanity she'd call this one the bearded man, for lack of any other name. Still, he looked almost familiar. She saw the man with the cane following him and wilted. She couldn't say what it was about Ospin that spooked her, only that something did. Maybe it was his face. Maybe it was his silence. Maybe it was just the way he looked right through her. She didn't like it. They had yet to speak so much as two words to one another and for some innate reason she'd already formed a strong dislike of the man. Naruto shifted his body just so, placing himself in the man's line of sight. Cinder wasn't quite sure why that left her so relieved. Aha there she is then the bearded man took one look at her and all that grand composure he'd shown earlier shattered like brittle glass. My word, she's adorable in short order Cinder found herself swept into strong arms once more, unable to escape her captor's grasp. And tiny wherever did you find her? Mantle, Naruto said pointedly. Mantle, you say isn't there an orphanage down there? Cinder made a noise of disgust. Naruto and Willow shrugged helplessly. A flicker of concern passed through the elder man's gaze followed by righteous fury, but he tamped it down. Cinder noticed. You learn to notice tiny tells like that when you lived on the streets. Interesting. Perhaps this man wasn't as much of a fool as he let on. Instead he released her and rounded on Willow with a smile. My dear, I know I said I wanted grandchildren but this is so soon so sudden. Daddy, no. Willow groaned. By the gods, please don't overreact again. Daddy, yes Nicholas Schnee crooned. She's absolutely adorable. Cinder tried to dive out of the way when he patted her head. A thought occurred to her and she froze beneath that large hand, her blood turning to ice. Daddy that meant father. Willow Schnee only had one father. By the brother gods this was Nicholas Schnee. Quite possibly the richest man in all of Atlas, perhaps even Remnant itself. And he was being kind to her. Or maybe this wasn't an act after all. Maybe she'd gotten lucky. Maybe they did care. Was she safe here unlikely? Nowhere was ever truly safe. But this place was safer than most. She could play the part, then. So long as they didn't hurt her. She was wasn't like the other street rats. If anyone tried that they'd get a knife in the leg. It wasn't like she was ungrateful or anything. She dreamed of a place like this for as long as she could remember. Why wouldn't she? She'd lived her life in the shadow of Atlas, clawing and scratching for what little she could find, all the while wondering what it was like up here. Now she was the one looking down on the world. Her stomach chose that moment to growl. Sounds like someone's hungry. Naruto smiled. Cinder clamped both hands on her stomach and scowled at it. Betrayal. Right then, shall we ask been offered, earning a blacker look from her that in turn drew a confused blink. I believe dinner is served. We did come to fetch you, originally. He took in the damaged walls with a glance and a small frown pulled at his mouth. As for Miss Branwen, Raven bristled. We will have words later. Oh so Team STRQ answered to Ospin. She'd remember that. Come on, sis. Kuro tugged her aside. Let's go and get you patched up. You can eat later. Dibs on Ty Summer laid claim to the blonde's arm before he could escape. 
We'll catch up with you in a bit. Tomorrow Raven craned her neck back and glared bloody red daggers at Naruto. Don't forget, or I swear by all that's holy, I will find you. Hiro muttered an apology and ferried her away. With that matter dealt with, Naruto turned and knelt, capturing Cinder's attention once more. You want up, kiddo. On his back happily Cinder clambered onto his shoulders like a monkey, glad of the chance to rest. What followed was a confusing maze of halls and corridors that she couldn't even begin to remember, yet tried regardless. She failed spectacularly. Whatever the case, the Schnee Mansion was a maze. A few maids and the odd servant favored them with odd looks, but with Nicholas and Willow present, none dared to challenge them. And then, quite suddenly, they arrived. When they led her into the dining room, her jaw nearly dropped. Defiance compelled her to click it shut and swallow the drool that began to pool in the corner of her mouth. It had nothing to do with the room, its long table, or even the lovely lit windows that let in the light of the shattered moon nigh above. No, her attention was decidedly drawn elsewhere. Her mouth clicked open again, and this time she couldn't quite keep herself from grinning at the sheer decadence of it all, for it was the contents of the table that seized her sight. So, much, food plates upon plates of it, ham turkey food she'd never seen before. Naruto set her down and snatched one such plate for himself as he took up a perch on the windowsill. He didn't move from that spot, even as he began to eat. A small distant part of Cinder respected that even as she beheld the feast before her. You never could let your guard down in the presence of strangers. But the pleasant aroma of in the buffet before her inevitably claimed her attention once more. Was it even possible to have such a bounty in one place even the gangs didn't eat this well at their peak? Feel free to eat whatever you wish, Willow's hand guided her forward to a seat and Cinder numbly followed. Her hand stretched out and she yanked it back. No, she mustn't give in. This was a trick. It must be. They were trying to deceive her when they yet as she watched a happily smiling summer settle in beside her and Willow on her right, her defiance buckled. More so when they set a plate of turkey and mashed potatoes before her, the latter heaped in gravy. Go ahead. It's not poisoned, Senior Ruta waved, mouth full of food. Winter pinged a fork off his head and he barely batted an eyelash. The dam broke and young Cinder tore into as though it were her last meal. Naruto blew out a breath and watched from his perch as she devoured the food. Adopting a kid. What the hell had he been thinking he didn't know the first thing about raising a kid? Did he regret it not at all? There was just something about Cinder that told him he'd done the right thing. Who knew what she might have become if he'd left her in that alley? Case in point, she held out an empty plate. More. You'll get sick if you eat too fast. Willow warned. Don't care more. Willow arched an eyebrow. May have I more, please? Cinder squirmed in her seat, then considered again, trying to choose the best words for maximum effect. Mommy. Summer choked on her drink. Willow's face turned incandescent. Naruto tumbled out of the window with a startled squawk of shattered glass. Critical damage. Cinder laughed, then clamped a hand over her mouth as she realized he'd just fallen out of a window. That wasn't good, was it? A jaunty whistle greeted her and quite suddenly the blonde walked back up the way he'd came, cresting the windowsill with ease. His hand swung over the edge, brushed a bit of glass from his coat, and that was that. As she looked in disbelief he calmly took a seat across from her and chose another plate. Still alive, thank God for check or what why are you all looking at me like that Hatai anybody? Willow sighed. Why am I not surprised? How did you do that summer squeaked out? Naruto blinked. Chakra, how else can't you do that? Tiang finally found his voice. Not that was quite different. Nicholas hummed as he tore into a stake. See, I told you he was unique. Ospin's eyes visibly bulged and Cinder stifled a smile at the sight. Good. She hoped he choked. So, this was to be her new life, then. In all honesty, she liked it. She liked it a lot. Three meals a day. Clean clothes. A warm bed. Affection. Love. Care. Naruto and Willow were odd. Team STRQ was odder still. Ospin was the only one she was genuinely uncomfortable around for reasons she couldn't understand but she wouldn't have to deal with him for long. And the rest were well, they were nice. They didn't hit her. Didn't beat her. There was no pain here. No panic. Only peace. Why were her eyes wet? Yuho. Naruto found her first. You okay? There. H. Cinder blinked, rubbed her eyes with a small hand, utterly baffled when it came away damp. I don't understand. Why am I? She tried to speak further, all that emerged was a small hiccup, followed by a hysteric giggle. She couldn't stop the tears, for all her fierceness, she was still just a child after all. Paranoia and suspicion could only last so long and she wasn't as strong as she believed herself to be. In another life she would have grown up to be a cruel and vicious woman who cared for no one besides herself and naught but power. But here now she was just a little girl and surrounded by a group of people who were, all things considerate insane. There was no other word for them. Was it any small surprise that they'd affected her so? Is it really all right for me to be here she whispered, scrubbing at her face furiously to no avail. All she managed was a watery smile. Willow realized what was happening next and wrapped an arm around her. Oh, sweetie, of course it is. Naruto didn't walk, rather, he absolutely vaulted the table to give her the same treatment. Summer's hand massaged the small of her back and that was all it took. Something in Cinder broke, she laughed and cried all at once. And in doing so, she set herself free. Everyone was laughing at him. Jack Jill knew it, even when his friends lied right to his face. You're being paranoid, they said. It wasn't that bad, they said. Liars. Filthy hypocrites, the lot of them. They turned on him. Everyone had turned on him. 
their whispers dogged his every step around every corner and every face he saw. Everyone sneered at him, silently mocking him for his failure, this once great man brought so low. They all knew his face. They all knew his failure. How could they not? His sorry face was plastered all over the news. People loved gossip nearly as much as they loved scandal and Jack was both, albeit not at all in the way he'd intended. There was no escape from their laughter, even here in the sparse comforts of his threadbare apartment. These days, this was all that remained. It was all he could afford. The news was a cold comfort. Redrimmed eyes stared at the television, glowering as he watched the scene play out before him, over and over again. Mercifully, tonight's story wasn't about him. Unfortunately, it was about her. Willow. Willow and that blasted ponce she'd taken up with. What were they doing down in Mantlebaugh? What did it matter? With a roar, the once proud man snatched up the remote and flung it headlong at the television. It bounced off the screen, leaving an ugly crack behind. Again, another reminder of his failure. All because he'd made the mistake of trying to court Willow Schnee. His plan had been brilliant or so he told himself in its complexity. Worm his way into Willow Schnee's heart with his debonair ways until she opened her legs for him. From there, he would use her as leverage for his true goal, thereby wriggling his way into the good graces of Nicholas Schnee. Convince the man that he was the only one fit to run the SDC. Sire a few brats off his bitch of a daughter. Wait until the man passed and the waters were calm. Then he would strike, buy off the shareholders, claim the company for himself and profit endlessly. No one would have been the wiser. Instead she'd ruined him, her and that blasted boy toy of hers. He'd never heard of this Naruto fellow before, any attempt to dig up information on him had failed utterly. Now his contacts had all but run dry, and with them, the very last of his favors. Jack Jill had not been a rich man, but he'd had a decent amount of Leon tucked away over the years. That was gone now, burned away to trying to find a ghost in the night. He didn't exist. There was no proof of anyone named Naruto Yuzumaki anywhere. A man with one arm and those features tended to stand out. An assumed name it must be. But that made him a ghost, and he lacked the resources to continue. But he would find a way. He still had contacts. Men owed him favors. Powerful men or so they had. Atlas had turned its back on Jack Jill. They say bigger you are, the harder the fall, the higher one climbs the ladder of life, the greater risk of being broken by said fall. Jack had climbed very high indeed. It had only taken one bad day to bring him crashing low. His reputation only suffered further in the days hence. When one lived in the clouds for so long, the fall was high indeed. Sometimes he wondered if he could fall further still. It seemed impossible. Someone knocked on his door. Begone he growled incoherently. I'm not taking visitors. The knock intensified. Once, twice, thrice, until finally he could stand it no more. Mustache twitching and eyes ablaze, the former businessman flung himself from his chair and marched across the room. Three swift strides carried him to the door, where he seized the worn lock handle and flung the ladder open with a crash. He cared not who it was, whomever dared disturb would rue the day they messed with. Jack Jill, his protest froze in his throat. Hey, ah, who are you, what are you doing here? A cloaked figure awaited him in the hallway without, at first he couldn't be certain if it was a man or a woman. No, he realized as they stepped forward and shoved him back inside. Their arm was too slim, and such a fine figure could only belong to one of the fair sex even clad in black as she was. He tried in vain to catch a glimpse of them, but the hood remained up and thick black masks concealed any and all hints of their visage. They carried a strange silver case of sorts at their side, no a briefcase, he realized. This was a woman, though the realization did him precious little good. He was more concerned with the bearded man looming beside her. Whomever he was, he was an absolute giant, stocky and broad of shoulders, dressed in plain clothes. Unlike the woman, he made no effort to conceal his face, or even a cloak for that matter. Was it some boldness on his part or did he simply not care? Your actions have not gone unnoticed. The man rumbled and his voice was like a slow-moving avalanche. My name is Hazel Reinhardt. For what it's worth, I apologize for the intrusion. The still-silent woman drew forth an orb from within and held it out to Hazel, who in turn offered it to him. Our employer wishes to speak with you, Hazel said. In hindsight, maybe he shouldn't have touched it. The moment he did a shadowy figure burst from the sphere, filling the room with smoke. Jack saw it. Her. His mind revolted. Death. She was death and despair incarnate and seeing her broke him. He screamed and clamored backwards like a drunken spider until his back struck a wall. He kept screaming. It was a sharp, startled sound, one that seemed to go on forever and ever until he could scream no more and had shouted himself hoarse. It could have been minutes. It felt like hours. It didn't matter. It did matter. Nothing mattered. He couldn't think straight, not when faced with this demon, this devil, this absolute monstrosity. They made no move to silence him, only staring at him with those ghastly red eyes. This was a dream. It had to be. He drank too much and fallen asleep, surely. Well, well, well. The specter of a woman crooned at him in a voice that was pure sin itself. What do we have here a rat cowering in the dark? What is it you desire, little man? What Jack croaked out, incredulous. The woman scoffed. Hazel, you assured me this one would be useful. The giant grunted, utterly unfazed by her anger. He will be, once he recovers his senses. I hope so. Those eerie scarlet orbs rimmed by black swung back now, locking on to Jack. It would be a shame to kill him. Revenge. Jack croaked the word out without thinking, anything that would allow him to survive. It drew their attention and he bowled on like a frantic rat, desperate to save his skin. 
You ask me what I want. I'm telling you. Someone made a fool of me, made me the laughingstock of Atlas. He ruined me. I want him dead. No, I want him broken. I want him brought low, lower than I was. Please don't kill me. I have connections. I can help you. I'll do anything. Jack gasped, reaching out hand toward the shadowy figure as he knelt. Anything. Her smile made his very soul shudder. Is that so? Eh, and Cinder really stole the show, didn't she? Next chapter will focus on Naruto and the others again, don't you worry. And now Jack has been approached to be Sailman someone. Surprise, surprise. I'm not giving names. In other news, we'll get to see the White Fang next chapter. Pairing is still up in the air. Naturally I cut some of the previews out, can't go tossing everything into one chapter after all, as much as I'd like to. Which makes me feel rather bad for Ironwood, given that his scene keeps getting kicked back. I just need to find a transition point into it, and that didn't work out here. Next chapter for sure. On another note, careful what you wish for, Naruto. Go to Atlas, he said last chapter. I'll help anyone who needs it, he said. Of course the White Fang is going to notice that as did Kali and Gira, whom we'll see soon enough. Haven't forgotten about Sienna either. Remember, at this point in time the White Fang is still very much a peaceful organization. Of course, there will always be some Faunus who are violent and humans who dislike said Faunus, but that's simply the way the world works. A reminder, review votes for the pairing are worth double those on the poll. It's still a close race tell me what you think. This chapter was more of a build-up than the rest, the gears have begun to turn and there's no going back. For better or worse, Naruto's made changes. Changes that we're all well aware of, but he certainly isn't. For instance someone saw the hint last chapter 1 that Cinder and Nicholas expounded upon that more than a few folk have mistaken Naruto for a Faunus. One with a schnee at that. He doesn't much care to correct those people at this time, even if he did, many would make their own assumptions. Some seem to think I favor Cinder in my stories, in truth, I really don't. She just tends to feature prominently, as does Raven. In some she dies. In others, she lives. Oi, don't give me that look I ain't spoiling anything I have standards also, full credit to Fox Boss for arm ideas. You'll see some wacky ones in coming chapters. In his own words, I'm thinking Watts decides to go full throttle with it and makes various types for multiple situations and fighting styles. You have no idea. As for pairing Snope, not telling yet. In fact, I've even created a poll on my profile. Give it a look and a vote after you review, will you? Or you could just vote via review. I tend to prefer that, these days. Reviews are all that keep this sick man going these days, they truly brighten my day. So in the immortal words of Atlas, review, would you kindly, and enjoy the previews. As ever, a warning. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Read at your own risk. Plot details, ahoy. Read at your own risk. Still here, are we alrighty then? Someone asked if Naruto's just gonna go around adopting all the kids. Oh, oh, is that a challenge? It sounds like a challenge. Well then, challenge accepted. Of course, he's going to have kids of his own, but I won't say with who. Not yet. Keep those votes, reviews coming. There's a mob of Faunus outside. Nicholas arched a bemused brow as the blonde blinked sleep from his eyes. You're doing, I suspect. Yeah, I'll deal with it. Why, hey, let me go, I'll get you, old man. Naruto twitched. Why, you little I'm not that old, you little shit. Roman kicked him in the groin. The blonde absolutely hissed, but didn't drop him. HRMPH, some master thief. Still, you've got guts breaking into my house. Instead he grinned, and it was a terrifying thing indeed. I like that. Now where's your little friend I saw earlier? There she is. Blue eyes snapped into gold and he swept a hand outward to seize a small body by the scruff of the neck before she could slit his throat. Neo's tiny form flailed desperately, to no avail, though she did manage to stick the bastard in the ribs with her blade. He merely rolled an eye, swung her around, and sent her crashing into Roman. The impact wrenched them both free and the boy's heart leaped into his throat. This was at their chance to escape, get the hell out, and... The door slammed shut in their faces. Rather than pursue, their would-be victim pulled up a chair. You know, I was just telling Cinder she needed to make some friends. Their captor hummed. She's not a very social child, you see. Cinder soon realized she was the only one still standing, and only then out of mercy. No fair summer sprawled flat on her back. You cheated. Willow joined her a heartbeat later. Too fast. Raven gurgled breathlessly. Absolute bastard. Naruto shrugged. Round two. Die. What do we do if a boy tries to hold your hand? Cinder tilted her head, ebony tresses falling across an amber eye. Stab them. Bingo's strong arms swept her up with a delighted roar, heedless of the yelp that followed. Got it on one that's my girl. Freya hummed softly. Aren't you a wild child? Cinder absolutely hissed and dove behind Naruto's legs. Don't mind her. She's shy. I'm sorry if she's caused you any trouble. He wasn't prepared for her laughter. Not at all why, she makes me feel young again. I've seen the future these are no saviors they are demons in disguise and that that is no child. The madman raved at them, spittle frothing and flying from their lips. That is a monster. A long, bony finger jabbed at Cinder and she shrank back with a glower. There, there it is do you see the look in her eyes. Brothers and sisters do you see the hate she holds for her fellow man she will burn us all mark my words she shall be the ruin of remnant once she's grown listen not to these fools trust in the one true goddess trust in Salem kill the demon kill the witch. Naruto growled. All right, that settles it. Cult leader, decking him now. Willow was faster. Her rapier flicked out into the man's chest, knocking him from his pedestal. 
Her name is Cinder. She planted a boot on his chest. And mark my words, you lay a hand on her your hand comes off. If you have to look along the shaft of an arrow from the wrong end, if a man has you entirely at his mercy, then hope like hell that man is an evil man. Because the evil like power, power over people, and they want to see you in fear. They want you to know you're going to die. So they'll talk. They'll gloat. They'll watch you squirm. They'll put off the moment of murder like another man will put off a good cigar. So hope like hell your captor is an evil man. A good man will kill you with hardly a word. Terry Pratchett, Men at Arms, Crossing the Line. Funny thing about shadow clones. Some say they're a perfect replica of their creator in every sense of the word. They'd be right. Mind, memories, thoughts, even mannerisms, they are in every way identical to their creator. Given enough chakra and proper motivation, they can accomplish nearly any task. They're easily capable of recognizing a threat and taking the initiative against. Their only true limit is their durability, that is to say, their capacity to withstand pressure or damage in the face of said threat. When made durable enough and with enough numbers, they could be a potent threat. Naruto had left behind more than two dozen such clones in mantle. Nearly thirty, to be exact. Lacking the proper form and focus that came with the hand signs, Naruto had simply brutaforced the Jetsu to create clones of himself for a singular goal. He hadn't given it any thought. In all honesty, he'd forgotten about his brothers in arms through no fault but his own. He'd been too preoccupied with Willow then Cinder and all the chaos that followed to consider releasing his Jutsu. He didn't even think to dispel those that remained before he fell asleep. Their purpose had been to hold back an angry group of faunus and keep the peace, nothing more. He knew that. They knew that. By the time he'd turned in for the evening, the thought of them had all but slipped his mind. Surely they couldn't get caused too much trouble. Of those clones, many did their their duty and selflessly sacrificed themselves to keep the mob at bay. Some deliberately chose to dispel themselves when they deemed their task complete and were never seen nor heard from again. Two wandered out past the walls and vanished into the elements. One took it upon himself to rid Mantle of crime what little time and chakra he had remaining and died in a blaze of glory. The results were surprising, to say the least. We'll come back to him later. Three, however, struck together, and their actions would forever change the shape of Remnant. With the original's departure to parts unknown and the crowd gone back to their homes, this unlikely trio found themselves somewhat bereft of purpose. Like the rest, they considered dispelling themselves alongside their brothers on principle, but decided against it. Instead they chose to wander. They vanished soon enough, and like their creator, they were curious about the world around them. The original had expressed a desire to see more of this place after all. Their experiences would go on to join his when they died, so it wasn't as if they'd ceased to exist. For lack of anything better to do, they walked. And as they walked, they gave names to themselves. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, 1, 2, 3, simple as can be. Perhaps those were a touch odd as far as names went, but the clones deemed these strange designations sufficient for their limited existence. In short order the unlikely trio found ways to distinguish their appearances from one another. The strongest of the group, Alpha, snatched up a worn piece of black cloth from a clothesline and tied it around his forehead. The wisest, Beta, chose a scarlet scarf to conceal the lower half of his face from view. Unfortunately the kindest of them and also the youngest of them by virtue of creation didn't bother to disguise themselves at all, much to the chagrin of his elder brothers. You're not gonna change anything? Gamma Alpha asked. No. The third clone scoffed and crossed both arms behind his head. Don't feel like it. A lead clone snagged a battered fedora from a sleeping drunkard and slammed the hat down on their brother's head. Hey, there we go. He grinned as Gamma grappled with the new headgear to no avail. It was all but wedged around his head. Don't sulk now. I think it suits you. Hey, I've been meaning to ask, he began, drawing their attention. How's it feel, having a metal limb? You do realize you have one, too. Beta pointed out. Right there. On your arm. Yeah, but who better to ask than myself, right? The trio exchanged a knowing look. Shaddy, aren't you Alpha paused to heft his prosthetic limb and considered it as one might a shiny new tool? I guess it feels light. Lighter than it should be at any rate. A flick of the wrist produced an audible click and he flinched, half expecting a weapon to pop forth. Thankfully, none did. This time. Hey, I thought it would be heavier, or something. With painstaking care he forced the metal fingers to lock into a fist and not for the first time, smiled at them. Still, it's a good fit. We'll have to pay Watts back for this. I know, right Gamma grinned like a child. Isn't it awesome? Fits like a glove. Beta conceded with a nod. Yes, that Arthur guy knows his stuff. Seems a little odd, though. Why so many weapons? Dunno. Gamma shrugged, considering his own arm. You know, we didn't really get a look at everything, did we, huh? He frowned. Wonder what this button does. Don Alpha and Gamma clamped their hands down on his arm before he could press the trigger. What's wrong, I mean, it's not like Arthur's a bad guy. Gamma raised his good hand in protest, he's just a bite eccentric. We've met people like that before. Maybe he needs a friend. Sure. Beta snorted. You think everyone needs a friend? Don't the Gamma tilted his head. Alpha blew out a sigh. Children. In hindsight, he couldn't really say where the three of them had begun to change, or even why for that matter. When had they gone from get the job done to asking what next? 
When had things changed? Shadow clones were duplicates of the original after all. Body doubles meant to fulfill their tasks and disappear. Nothing more, nothing less. Yet they'd survived their initial purpose and been left to fend for themselves, with the original none the wiser. Perhaps it had something to do with the lack of seals. He'd used. Perhaps it was the check report out to make them. Naruto had used a lot of it. Perhaps it was simply a twist of fate. Who could say for a Jinchuriki, such was little more than a tiny drop in a bucket for him, but to the clones, it made all the difference. By now they were both of him and yet not him. Each different, each in their own ways. They had hours to walk about now time in which to form their own impressions of the world and the world had shaped them in turn. Beta was unusually taciturn, showing a reserved side that bordered on melancholy. Not quite sadness, not quite sorrow, but something else. Cynicism, perhaps. Gamma, meanwhile, empathized Naruto's kindness, and was almost childlike in his compassion and humor. He was quite possibly the purest of them, untainted by doubt or fear. Alpha felt these things, but they were muted, overshadowed by a different emotion. Beta embodied cynicism and Gamma was empathy incarnate. That much was true. He answered to a higher calling. Curiosity. Of his existence, of this world, of so many things. Like the original, he had questions, and he wouldn't hesitate to find the answers, though his time was short. Even with their overabundance of chakra, the three of them were steadily burning through it merely by existing. Never mind more physical acts such as fighting or running. In all likelihood, they wouldn't be around to see the next sunset. Not without a chakra transfusion or some very clever thinking. What are we supposed to do? Anyway Gamma's gentle inquiry drew him back to reality. This is nice and all, but should we really be wandering around like this? Yeah, it's not like the boss man to let us walk around like this. Beta pointed out, raising a finger. He's probably gonna dispel us the second he wakes up, you know what's the point of. Brothers and sisters I call upon you to repent. As one, the unlikely trio stopped dead in their tracks. Repent only a few yards away, a man clad in dark purple robes stood atop a podium at a nearby corner, prattling onto a mismatched gaggle of human and faunus alike. His shrieks had swallowed their words. The end times are nigh. Gamma cringed at the sight of him. The hell is he on about he's noisy. Ha, ah, neat. Beta thumbed his chin. So they have fanatics here, too. Wanna knock him out. Alpha clicked his teeth. No, let him be. We're not here to start trouble. He's not causing any harm it. Salem has come her apostles are here among us in this very city. Repent, repent as they strode past the madman threw his head back with a mad cackle and reached slender arms into the sky, fingers grasping it. The broken moon as though to seize it in his very hands. Cannot you not see her signs in the sky? The child has been taken and soon, soon the fires will rise. Abandon your false gods. Throw yourself at her feet and be saved. Repent before it's too late. Repent. Ignore him. Already him. Beta yawned. Let's get something to eat. We don't have any money. Alpha groaned. No, don't even give me that look. No stealing. These folk have little enough as it is. You, their pretender shadows of the imposter the madman priest continued to rave at their backs as they left him to his sermon. Do you not see the truth of Salem's grace? Are you blind? Do you not see how meaningless your little lives are? It was like flicking a switch. Something ugly reared its head in Alpha's heart and the clone turned his head a fraction of an inch. A lone blue eye leered over his shoulder and bore into the priest with killing intent. Just a little. Just a touch. Not enough to cause any irreparable damage on his part, but it silenced the lunatic all the same. He foamed at the mouth and toppled off his crude podium with a gurgling squawk. Alpha raised a lone finger in salute as they sauntered away. No one bothered to catch the madman, nor did anyone dare to challenge them as they departed. Good. Mantle was chaotic enough, the last thing it needed was a cult. And who the hell was Salem? Why had that name sent a chill down his spine? Putting that little incident aside, regardless of what happens to us tonight or tomorrow, our experience will live on through the original. He continued, guiding his brothers around another corner and away from the raving lunatic, either way, the outcome is the same. I'm sure he won't mind. He flashed them a grin that he hoped looked reassuring. What's wrong with living a little? Eh, what could possibly go wrong when neither answered he paused and turned, frowning now as his brothers fixed him with a deadpan look. What, why are you looking at me like that? What did I say? Beta face bombed. You've doomed us all, you old fool. A laugh burst out of him. Hey, now I'm the same age as you two. Doom Gamma echoed with faux despair. We're gonna have bad luck now, all because of you. Bah, we're fine he turned up his nose. What's the worst that could happen? There it is Gamma's finger jabbed his arm. You just did it again traitor are you trying to get us killed? Stubborn bastard. Beta grumbled in agreement. Who put you in charge? Anyway I don't recall us putting this to a vote. Hey, the position was open. Alpha puffed out his chest as he stepped over a sleeping man on the sidewalk. He paused and considered him, then gave the poor sod the jacket off his own back before continuing. Neither of you took it so, by virtue of having the most chakra, it went to me. He shrugged as his brothers in arms continued to glower at him. Besides, the boss created me a whole five seconds before either of you big lugs, so that means I'm in charge. A pause followed as he reconsidered his words. Till he wakes up and dispels us, at least. Gamma looked like he was about to retort something to that effect, but he paused instead. Frowned, sniffed at the air. Why do I smell smoke? He blinked rapidly, eyes widening. No, not smoke kinda smells like ash. Alpha face bombed in the same moment. It's probably nothing. Maybe hopefully. Someone screamed in the distance. Beta arched an eyebrow. Nothing, hey. 
Damn it. Limited though it was compared to the original, the three of them could still sense some semblance of negative emotions. Something had spiked just now. Something close. Very close, indeed. Close enough to send people running for their homes and away from the noise. Credit where it was due, Alpha didn't hesitate and neither did his brothers. They raced right into the chaos after him. Bounding around the corner, he darted around a frantic couple, vaulted a food stall and snagged the first passerby he could find. What's going on here? He soon wished he hadn't, for they soon supplied them with an answer. His eyes did the rest. Mantle was on fire. Much to their horror, nearly an entire street had gone up in flame. Some of it was still burning even, buildings collapsing in on themselves as he looked on. Alpha's next thought was to spring into action, but even as he stepped forward to do so he saw that there was no need. Even now the last of the fires were being actively doused as the last of their occupants evacuated. Had that been the end of it, the clones would have walked away, just as they'd done so for that fanatic on the corner. It was not, because a crowd had gathered in the shadow of those smoldering buildings. Human and Faunus, one to each side. Almost exclusively so. There's no need for this. Hogama perked up. Seems someone beat us here. Don't sound so disappointed. Beta's elbow lightly tapped his side. It's better this way. Is it Alpha queried? A smartly dressed man clad in atlas colors accompanied by a pair of soldiers stood amidst the crow, both arms raised on either side in a desperate attempt to placate them. Neither of the unlikely trio much understood the purpose of his uniform. Willow had explained the intricacies of the military, save that they were ruthlessly efficient and quite good at what they did. Something like this would draw their attention. Alpha paused at the edge of the crowd with his brothers, suddenly hesitant to intervene. Those didn't look like rank-and-file soldiers surrounding the man in uniform. One of them looked their way and he ducked back. Please, calm yourselves the man's voice boomed as they approached. There's no need for violence, we'll get to the bottom of this. Unfortunately the crowd seemed to disagree with that remark, judging by the vehemence of their reaction. Piss off, Ironwood. What's a captain like you doing down here? Come to rub elbows with the common folk, have ye? Alpha and Beta exchanged a bleak look. Ironwood didn't Watts mention someone by that name. Did he now it was Gamma's turn to frown? I don't really remember. You wouldn't. Beta sniped. Too busy with your new toy. Hey, in hindsight, it didn't take much to see why they were making such remarks. Both groups looked well, rough, to say nothing of the mismatched weapons gripped in their hands. They likely wanted blood and would settle for nothing less. Perhaps this lot were the castoffs from the last crowd they'd stopped. Perhaps they were simply drunken louts who'd had won too many and were spoiling for a fight. Perhaps they'd lost loved ones in the blaze and grief had blinded them to the truth. Whatever the case, they were spoiling for a fight and about to get one from the looks of it. These folks clearly wouldn't back down without violence. Still, to intervene now would be. That looks ugly. Should probably do something about it. Gamma muttered, drawing his attention. We're gonna help, right? We can't just leave them like this. They've got weapons. Beta grumbled. Duh. So do we. Gamma hefted his metal arm. We can take him. They outnumber us. His grin grew. Then it'll be a fair fight. For them. This isn't our fight exasperated. Beta pulled their younger brother aside and gave him a good hard shake. We're clones, remember accident or not, and poof. We're gone. Gamma's guileless grin alarmed him. And that's a problem because, oh for the love off talk some sense into him beta hissed at Alphas, who hadn't spoke a word. We need to leave. Now, before we draw attention to ourselves. Why Gamma snapped back. We haven't done anything wrong. Stop being so damn skittish. Alpha shushed them both again and tried to listen in. We're not here to make any arrests once more Ironwood raised his arms toward the crowd as he continued to implore them. We don't mean you any harm though he looked harried, his voice remained strong in the face of their adversity. We just want to understand what happened here. It was the right thing to say, but it backfired, because the faunus side all but bristled and the humans weren't far behind. Liar. Atlas scum. Don't believe a word he says. It made a strange sort of sense, really, of course the Atlas military wouldn't take kindly to a ruckus down here in Mantle. Least of all a fire of this magnitude. They weren't the sort to ignore this kind of destruction and it seemed the faunus were getting the brunt of the blame. Honestly, it made Alpha pity their plight all the more. Poor sods. Atlas was cold enough but Mantle was freezing. Small wonder they were miserable. He could see why the original wanted to do something about that. A thorn of guilt stabbed at what passed for his heart. Sienna did it a portly man wearing a butcher's apron over dark clothes stepped froth from the crowd, braying like a bull. She started the fire I saw her skulking about. Her. Alpha tilted his head. Beta and Gamma mirrored him. This off. Raul I didn't do shit a young voice cracked back like a whip, drawing their attention to a third party in the crowd. I was just trying to get a meal. Alpha finally glimpsed the speaker near his elbow. The young woman didn't see him yet, but he saw her, a rough-looking girl with hair dark as ebony, clad in strange leathers of black and orange alike oho her tan skin blemished with dirt and bruises. Oddly enough her arms were exposed, and were those stripes on her arms tattoos birthmarks, maybe he couldn't be sure. She was a faunus however, of that much there could be no doubt. Those furry ears twitching atop her head couldn't be anything but, by the log, she looked absolutely livid when the butcher replied. The hell you were Raoul scoffed. I don't serve Faunus. No, you don't. In spite of her injuries, Sienna's golden eyes burned with defiance and she railed at the butcher with a singular ferocity that belied her slight size. 
which is why I had to rummage through your scraps for a decent meal. She turned her head and spat at his feet. Again, an angry murmur moved through the crowd. Gamma turned aside. She's kidding, right? Why would people do this? Alpha and Beta exchanged another bleak look. Aha, the butcher jabbed a finger at her with a triumphant cry, heedless of the angry blue eyes blazing into his back. You see, she admits that she was here murderer. I never said that she stepped forward to meet him, reaching for the chain whip resting against her hip. Get the wax out of your ears. Ironwood stepped in to keep them apart. If you'll just allow us to take your statements, we can. Like how the girl viciously slapped his hand back with a cry. You'll throw me in a cell, you atlas prick I know you're kind. Alpha flinched, a thorn of guilty concern pricking at his chest. Had they caused this by preventing one outbreak of violence had they merely given rise to another to make matters worse. Ironwood and his men were still trapped between them both sides. Wasn't this their job was it really his place to intervene here? Well, Beta blew out a sigh and hung his head. Looks like he bit off more than he could chew. Someone's gonna start something at this rate. What do you wanna do? Non-lethal Gamma chirped, poking his head between them. Fine, don't hurt them too badly. Alpha rolled up his right sleeve. They're just ordinary people, most of them probably lack aura. We don't want to kill them. He turned a pointed gaze on Gamma. If this turns into a brawl, get the girl somewhere safe. Not the Schnee Mansion. He clarified when his brother opened his mouth. Beta and I will handle the rest. What, just the two of you got an ace up your sleeve or something? Beta's grin reminded him of a shark. You'll see. Someone off to one side snapped off a less than pleasant slur and everything spiraled into chaos. Then said someone raised a weapon. It wasn't much of one, little more than a pitchfork really. The tool itself didn't matter a bit. The act behind it did. It was like setting a match to a dry field, and his actions were the spark to ignite them. Hang her. It's all her fault. Yeah, kill the faunus. Rayo lashed out. So did Sienna. Without thinking, without thought, Alpha seized the young girl by the wrist and yanked her back. Startled, the faunus cried out, only to find herself flung into the ready arms of Gamma. In the same moment, Beta stepped forward and thundered a metal fist right into Raoul's meaty face. For all his earlier bark and bluster, the butcher dropped like a sack of potatoes. All the world went silent, and it was into this silence that Alpha spoke. That's quite enough. Killing intent flooded his words and throttled any response those in the crowd might have given. Something ugly reared its head in the back of his mind again. Sheep. They acted strong in a herd, but throw a few harsh words at them and they cowered like the cowards they were. Have you lost your minds? Gamma's words shattered the silence between them and brought him back to himself. You can't just execute someone like this, it's not right. I have a name, damn it, Sienna shouted in his arms. Yes, you do. Beta patted her head. Now shut the hell up. Hey, freaking Faunus Raoul groaned at their feet and tried to rise. Beta kicked him to make sure that didn't happen. The military man Ironwood stepped up to lay a hand on Alpha's shoulder. He barely felt it. I appreciate your assistance, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask. Alpha shook him off. You shush, we are talking. An uncharacteristic ember of anger ignited deep in his chest as he turned his gaze back to the crowd at their fear-stricken faces. Perhaps the captain was trying to do his job, but these people if he wanted a scapegoat. Someone to lash out against, someone to blame for all their fear and misery. In their eyes, guilt or innocence didn't matter. Someone needed to be punished and Sienna had been chosen for that role. Mob mentality at its finest. It made him sick. They should die. These folk were neither shinobi nor huntsmen, they weren't even people in his eyes. What had the original said come to Atlas he would help them help them ha the crowd from before might have been different, but these people didn't need help. They deserved to burn, each and every one off where had that thought come from the clone's eyes pulsed red for the merest of moments before he restrained himself. Breathe, boy. Calm down. Don't do anything reckless. Shaking his head he planted both feet and crossed his arms before his chest. Go home, the lot of you. The word emerged as a low, angry growl. You shall not pass. Beta stepped up to join him. If you want to fight that badly, then you'll be fighting all of us. Got it. Someone lobbed a rock at the back of his head, Alpha sensed it, caught it in his right hand, and ground it to fine powder in his palm. Slowly, painstakingly, he opened his fingers and let the dust fall to join the fresh snow upon the ground for all to see. When he raised his gaze, no more stones followed the first. A small, silent part of him took vindictive pleasure in the fear that followed. Several civilians backpedaled. Really a blonde eyebrow arched. We're throwing rocks, now I know the saying about casting stones, but this is a little ridiculous, don't you think? Freak someone cried go be with your own kind. Beta ducked as an empty wine bottle whizzed past his head. Hey, Alpha, meanwhile, blinked at the remark. Did they think he was a faunus? Right, to hell with this. He waved over his shoulder. Gamma, go. We'll join you later. Behind his brothers, Gamma stuck out his tongue and bolted, a struggling sienna still clutched against his chest. Incensed at the possibility of their quarry escaping what they believed to be retribution, several humans boiled forward on one side. A group of angry faunus moved to intercept them, leaving Ironwood and his men caught in the middle. Rather than intervene, the two officers closed ranks around their captain and ushered him to safety. It was here, in this brief, beautiful moment of chaos, that Alpha palmed a trio of smoke bombs into his hands. There were only two of them. That much was true. They made all the difference. The first grenade detonated between the mobs and spewed a noxious black smog into the night. 
Not a heartbeat later, a second landed, followed by the third from Beta. Caught unawares and with a rapidly expanding cloud of thick haze obscuring their vision, some of the less bold civilians opted to turn tail and run rather than face reprisal. None even paused to consider who had thrown them or why. Some, perhaps too foolish or too angry to reconsider their actions, still tried to attack. Poor choice, that. Alpha and Beta had no interest in getting dispelled, nor did they intend to perpetuate this farce any longer with Gamma safely away. Two trained clones with their blood up against a ragtag group of drunk and disorderly civilians. It wasn't even a contest. Caught unprepared by the sudden onslaught, the angry civilians were quickly overwhelmed. One turned to flee and Beta created another clone and launched them at him like a missile, tackling him to the floor before he could make his escape. Alpha blinked, bemused by the ingenuity. Not a bad tactic. Still, he didn't think they had enough chakra left to make clones. Apparently Beta did. Huh, neat. Something to remember for later. Still, after all that the brawl, mugging, or whatever the devil this was, ended in moments. Breaking of a bit of wire from their pouches, the clones went to work subduing their fallen assailants. Beta met his gaze as they bound the last of them. Looks like the captain's got some moves. He fought pretty hard. Alpha followed his gaze and soon saw what he was grasping at. A few unlucky sods had been foolish enough to go after Ironwood and his men. Judging by the twitching heap at his feet, they hadn't fared well. One of them was wrapped up by a length of steel cable stemming from was that a fishing rod who used a weapon like that whomever they were, they seemed preoccupied with the prisoners. Thanks small mercies for that. He did just about all he could stand of people for today. As such, when the captain came up to them, he nearly bolted. He expected handcuffs, a reprisal for excessive force at the very least. Instead he got a pat on the back. Well fought, the both of you. The man actually congratulated them you two acquitted yourselves well out there. Then I rest us Beta raised his chin in stoic defiance. I think not. The captain laughed, rubbing his fist. After that display, I dare say I'd like to recruit the two of you. Both blondes blinked. And you are, James. Their newfound acquaintance ally extended an arm to introduce himself. James Ironwood, you have my gratitude for what you did back there. When neither moved to take it, he hastened to explain. I had no intention of arresting that poor girl, but I couldn't intervene without starting an incident. For that, you have my thanks. Don't mention it. Alpha accepted it without thinking. More fool he. The man had a grip just like his name what was his hand, pure metal or something that's a strong grip you got there. I could say the same of you. The captain granted with a frown, though his eyes strayed to Beta. That trick you did earlier, was that a semblance just how many can you make? Beta made a choking sound and tugged his scarf higher to hide his face. Or something like that. Alpha didn't even pause to consider his answer. I dunno. Hundreds thousands never really tested our limits. As if to echo that very thought, Beta's clone shrugged and the absolute traitor dispelled itself in a plume of white smoke. Ironwood stiffened, his smile turning brittle with shock and disbelief. Alpha wasn't privy to his thoughts beyond that. Perhaps had he possessed such clairvoyance, he might have been more a touch warier with his words just now. How could he have known James didn't radiate such much as an iota of negativity, and whatever fell magic the mark on the original's hand wrought, it didn't transfer through to his clones. He was blissfully ignorant of what he'd just done, and the ramifications of his actions here in this moment. Idiot Beta hissed. The rest of the world wasn't. James choked, his mind a whirl with the implications of what he'd just been told. Hundreds no. Thousands if what he said was truth eyes individual was a one-man army. Atlas could use this. Benefit from this. No. Not just Atlas. Vale, Mistral, even Vacuo. The world. Kingdoms would kill for this kind of power. At his core, James was a good man. He had principles. Lines he'd rather not cross if he could help it. But others lacked such principles and wouldn't hesitate. Yet, any attempt to pressure or coerce this man was doomed to disaster. He could see that much. So he schooled his face into a stoic mask and chose his words carefully. Might I ask where the two of you are staying? Not a chance. Beta threw his arms up before Alpha could speak. I don't know you, and I sure as hell don't trust you. Ignore him. Alpha waved his brother off. He doesn't trust his own shadow. Ask Nicholas if you need something. Our boss is staying with him. Not again Beta made a noise of absolute disgust. Why are you telling him that are you trying to cause trouble or something for crying out loud, man? Boss Nicholas Ironwood nearly keeled over on the spot. As if matters weren't complicated enough by any chance do you mean Nicholas Schnee who exactly are you? Thank the gods he hadn't tried to pressure these two, or worse, arrest them never mind the fact that he wasn't sure he could take him in a fair fight, anyone with Schnee backing would absolutely bury him. You didn't mess with a Schnee. It just wasn't done. Nicholas Schnee was a kind fellow to be sure, but he'd go to hell and back for his friends and family. He wasn't eager to make an enemy of him. Moreover, Nicholas was an old friend. He wasn't sure what to make of this boss fellow, however. With such little information at hand, he didn't dare make any assumptions, save the worst. He pointedly noticed that these young men had yet to answer him. You're not going to tell me your names, are you? Beta all but flipped him off. Nope. Look, Alpha at least had the wherewithal to realize his earlier gaffe before he opened his mouth again. We're really not at liberty to explain ourselves here. When Ironwood tried to speak, he shushed him. It's not that I don't want to, it's just complicated. He amended at his brother's withering glare. If you want to talk that badly, take it up with the boss. Preferably in the morning. Morning a lot could happen by then. 
Ironwood resisted the urge to punch the nearest wall over and over again. Might I ask why he hazarded? Um, because he's asleep Beta tilted his head. We're not him. I don't understand. The captain blinked. You're you. You're standing right here. We all we are, but we aren't. Alpha granted him a sly grin. Like we said, it's complicated. More than you know. Oh, for the love of Bader rolled his eyes in response. Right, that settles it. I've had enough of this crap. I'm going back. You're leaving Alpha arched an eyebrow. After all that here I thought you weren't the sort to get sentimental. You're going to dispel yourself just like that. Something like that. The second clone snapped his fingers. Don't give me that look. It's not like I'm leaving. Not really. I'm just going back to where I belong. Inside his head. It's where we belong. I'll see you there. Alpha tried to speak, tried to muster some witty send-off, but all that emerged was a soft croak. Why did this feel so bittersweet? Why did he care so much he shouldn't? And yet he did. They were little more than shadow clones, mere aspects of the original made manifest. They'd gained some semblance of self by chance, nothing more. No one would know them. No one would miss them. No one would mourn them. And yet, what are you crying for? The clone startled, surprised by him. For what it was worth, I had fun. Beta grinned, the clone's first real smile since his birth. See ya, partner. A plume of smoke consumed him. Ironwood jumped, looked over his shoulder, and back again. What in the where did he go? Home. Alpha sighed, shoulders drooping. I should be going, too. For the boss, this'll all be a vivid dream. But for Yao well, a bitter chuckle escaped him. Be nice to him, all right he's had a rough time. Alpha didn't so much blur as he did vanish. Even as James realized what he intended, the lone clone had already vanished in a swirl of leaves. By the time he thought to look up and caught sight of him again, the doppelganger was little more than a receding shadow on the rooftops, then not even that. He never saw the faint plume of smoke that followed, but he felt the cold breeze in his wake. Within moments he was gone entirely, leaving him to deal with the aftermath. It would be the beginning of a long evening for James, one that would change Remnant just a little more. For better or for worse, who could day? Naruto would wake to quite a spectacle come morning, utterly baffled by what had transpired in his absence. After all, for him, it was only a dream, little more than a fleeting phantasm. But this dream thigh's dream would change the world. Hey, in, don't worry, next chapter focuses on the main cast again. Let us know if you like the clones or not. Read this note would you kindly else you may find yourself horribly lost. Now before anyone squawks Naruto's clones aren't a plot device for convenience. They're a one-off. They had a purpose in this story, brief though it was, to show some of Naruto's emotions. Time and you, the reader will tell if we see them again. Once again, the gang and I had to split this chapter in two because we were getting so many messages demanding an update for this. Literally dozens in a day. You're getting the second half quite soon after this, so by all means, review away. If we get enough support, we'll try to have the second half of this chapter out this very week Thursday for you all to enjoy. But like I've said in the past, reviews are fuel, and they spur me and the gang to write all the faster. And it means longer chapters. Think on that for a moment. So in the immortal words of Atlas, review, would you kindly it keeps us all alive. Without reviews, we wither and die. Sorry, but that's the truth. Now then, we do hope you enjoy the previews. Read at your own risk, of course. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Plot details ahoy. You be warned. HRNGH, what a weird dream. You, me Naruto frowned. Sienna tried to bite his hand. Naruto groaned. Right. Training. Woo. Willow elbowed him. Don't be such a dolt. He promised, remember and besides. He looked down. Cinder's pleading expression turned his resolve to jelly. Gods, you could weaponize that kind of cuteness. How could anyone stand against it? All right, all right, geez, twist my arm, why don't you? No, 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 don't go, why, why are you leaving me here? Why am I always left alone? It's so lonely, I don't want to be alone. Men are weak. Divide them, place doubt in their minds, and any semblance of power they once had will wash away. Did it did it. Willow nearly keeled over on the spot. Nicholas chortled softly. You're clearly sweet on him, my dear. Why not? Okay, sadly, the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed, just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay, see you in the next video. Bye.